can get started with this fantastic lecture. I'm, um, how can I say, I'm very suspenseful because I was really looking forward to, to learn more about what makes Korean Buddhism Korean, right, in comparison to others. And uh, I'm really thinking today we will get all the great insights. So please give a big round of applause for Professor David Mason. Thank you, Sonia, ah, welcome. and welcome to everybody, glad you could come. I'm going to talk today about what makes Korean Buddhism really Korean style, what are distinctive things that are different from other countries, and then talk about one particular Buddhist master who really started the Koreanization of Buddhism, who founded Korea as a holy Buddhist land nearly 1400 years ago, and his legacy is still very strong in Korean Buddhism today, along with some spectacularly beautiful temples that he left behind. So I'll show you all about that. So we'll, first of all, we'll talk about distinctive characteristics, then we'll take a break, and then we'll get back and describe the great master, Jajang, and his accomplishments and his legacy. Okay, two-parter here. And so, first of all, Buddhism. I'm assuming that people understand what Buddhism is, is and is about. Um, generally, huh? 500 BC, this guy, the Buddha, in northern India, he was a Hindu. He's a Hindu, but he broke away from Hinduism. He made a radical offshoot. Let's say he said to Hindus, he said, you're doing it all wrong. And in particular, all their religious aspects, uh, what we might call religious beliefs in gods and spirits and heavens and hells and reincarnation cycle and uh, all that stuff, he said, was maybe not exactly false, but uh, irrelevant irrelevant, it's getting in the way. And extreme asceticism, extreme yoga practices, like starving yourself, not eating, uh, in order to try to attain enlightenment, that that doesn't work either. That a moderate path uh, was the best way, and really a psychological path way. He set up a way to live and a way to think and a way to practice spiritually so that you could move directly towards enlightenment in this lifetime. And uh, it was really kind of the way we look at it, the way we look at things now, it was really, a, really not a religion. It was kind of a psychological process. It was a self-help therapy thing that you could do, a pathway to follow in your life and uh, get to Buddhahood, enlightenment, which simply means waking up. Waking up as if from a long nightmare of illusion, delusion, that is causing suffering in human beings, in human life, simply to wake up from that. That's all that Buddha means. It's a word from the Sanskrit. Bud is a verb meaning to wake up from sleeping. And Buddha is the one who woke up and then he's trying to teach other people how to wake up from the nightmare. The nightmare that we are now living in and we don't even know that we're asleep. <laughs> and it's a delusional, a delusional view of the world that leads to suffering. Okay, yeah, he did this as a radical offshoot, uh, not really a religion, really just had a cult around him, never more than about a thousand people uh, seriously practicing this. And then uh, 250 years later, Emperor Ashoka conquers all of North India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, the whole region for the first time. I think you hear me fine, right? I do. do you think I need this? Is this a, does this help? Not really. People usually hear me just fine without that. Yeah, yeah. And anybody who can move forward if you have trouble hearing. I think we're cool. That's correct, though. <laughs> yeah, so Emperor Ashoka, he's the one who adopted Buddhism as his personal philosophy and religion, let's say, for his empire. And if, if he didn't do that, Buddhism would have remained some rather small cult around the, the Ganges River. But uh, he adopted it, and he declared it for his empire, and he spread it 
throughout his empire and even started sending missionaries. Buddhism became one of the great missionary religions of which really there's only three, uh, including Christianity and Islam. The three of those that really send people to other countries to say, hey, join our religion. Uh, all the other religious traditions and faiths really don't do that. Just those three. So it became one of the great ones and uh, spread to south to Sri Lanka and over to Southeast Asia and then north over the, into Central Asia, what we call the Silk Road, going to China. And especially the northern kind of Buddhism, it started after Ashoka, started incorporating parts of Hinduism back into it because it was mainly just a psychological philosophy in the beginning, but as it spreads to people, to common people, to, to regions and such as the religion of an empire, it needed religion. It needed things like heaven and hell and reincarnation and gods and spirits. And so it kind of brought those things that Buddha had actually kicked out of it, it brought them back in and incorporated them to be useful within the Buddhist philosophy. So it became something kind of different. And it moved this collection of beliefs, let's call it, uh, moved across the Silk Road, arrived in China about 100 AD, or a little before, 100 AD, so 1900 years ago, into China. And it got rooted. The Chinese found it fascinating, the intellectual class of China. It had all kinds of new ideas from the Hinduism, things like reincarnation that they had never really thought about before. And they spent hundreds of years uh, getting rooted in China. And uh, the Chinese discovered that it was very difficult to translate. The Sanskrit texts of Buddhism coming into China had a very different way of thinking, a very different way of looking at the world compared to, in, compared to China and India. That has had totally different assumptions of the nature of the world, of the cosmos, of human life and our place in it. Completely different ways and even different ways of teaching, different ways of presenting philosophy. The Chinese prefer as few words as possible and in India they prefer as many words as possible. Um, the more, the longer the book, the better. And the Chinese keep it short, keep it brief. So great difficulty in translation. They didn't even have any vocabulary in China to, for many of the concepts they were dealing with. They had to either invent new Chinese characters or use the Chinese characters from Confucianism and Taoism. Okay? Then it still it doesn't fit the Chinese mind. And so by about 500, 500 AD, they start making Chinese kinds of Buddhism, Chinese styles. They, they finally finish translating all this Sanskrit stuff and finding a whole lot of it doesn't make sense to them, doesn't really apply, and they start interpreting things, <laughs> reinterpreting to get a Buddhism that fits China, its culture, its way of thinking and such. And we start to get Chinese Buddhism by about 500. Great genius masters arrive who, who study the old texts and come up with a whole new way of dealing with them and much more Chinese style. Okay, by about 500. By about 300, missionaries are starting to reach Korea. Korean territories and the three kingdoms, the three great kingdoms, one of them Goguryeo, all of Manchuria and today's North Korea, gigantic kingdom and right down to China, to, right to the Great Wall of China. So easy access. Uh, missionaries can get there easily. And then Baekje, which is on the west coast of Korea, uh, also fairly easy access, a little more difficult, by ships across the Yellow Sea, by ships uh, back to the Shandong Peninsula of China. There is trade and commerce by this time. So missionaries come over there. And those two kingdoms, the west coast of Korea, from Seoul here all down the west coast, all the way down to the end, that's Baekje Kingdom, they start to flourish with Buddhism. They take on Chinese culture altogether. Buddhism comes together with all Chinese culture. Uh, silk clothing 
and hairstyles and Iron Age technology, reading and writing, which the Koreans never had before. They were uh, Bronze Age illiterate tribal people. Um, and uh, like wheels, the wheels on uh, carts and chariots pulled by horses, that kind of technology. That all came together with Buddhism entering Korea for hundreds of years and such. It was all kind of mixed together, perhaps in the Korean mind, that this is Buddhist technology, silk clothing is Buddhist clothing, and the idea of a king. Uh, the whole political idea of you're ruled by a king, not a tribal chief, that comes from China, together with Buddhism. And the idea that a king is a Buddhist king. Uh, a king is somebody who supports the Buddhist religion, and in turn, the Buddhist monks all praise and support the king. It's a deal. This is what happened through Central Asia and China, the way it developed uh, ever since Emperor Ashoka uh, himself. And, you know, church and state were definitely united <laughs> very much. It was a government religion and a, a uh, well, a religion that supported the government and a religion su supported by the government uh, very much. And so this makes characteristics and it's become something really very different than what Sakyamuni Buddha ever taught in India. He was an independent teacher who had nothing to do with the government and no particular respect for kings or anything he, from a princely family himself that had rejected all that. Whatever, uh, it became something very different from his rather simple and neat psychological process and lifestyle that he was teaching his pathway to enlightenment, it had become something very different, is my point, uh, by the time it gets rooted in Korea. We might say it was very corrupted. Corrupted. Uh, it wasn't any more about getting enlightenment, about waking up and becoming a Buddha. It was about building golden Buddha statues and having a magnificent big temple and monks in fine silk robes receiving gold from the king. And in exchange, the monks would hold ceremonies praising the government and wishing for good fortune for the nation, hoping the rains would come and the crops would be abundant. Uh, Stuff like this, uh, nothing to do with anything Buddha ever taught. And magic tricks, lots of magic. Simply, the Chinese had invented gunpowder, and for you, monks would use, like, gunpowder. Uh, at the, you know, the Chinese invented very simple fireworks at the uh, time, and Buddhist missionaries, like, you know, they build an altar, and they do the preaching, preaching about the power of Buddha, the glory of Buddha, as if Buddha is some kind of god, which he never was, uh, but spirits and bodhisattva spirits, and then at the, at they reach the climax and say, I show you the power of the Buddha, and behind the altar, some monk would be there with the fireworks, uh, setting and lighting them, and they go pew, 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 behind the altar, and everybody, all these Bronze Age people who had never seen any such thing, <laughs> wow, the power of Buddha, and uh, this sort of thing. We'd consider it very corrupt. We would laugh at it, sort of, uh, this whole thing. Now, fundamentally, fundamentally, there's three kinds of Buddhism, which becomes confusing at times. Of What is Buddhism? Three kinds, really. And uh, first of all, there is devotional Buddhism. Devotional, which is something that we would recognize as a religion. This means putting up statues and paintings and regarding them as, as we would call gods, with a small g, generally gods of various kinds, and worshipping them, praising them, saying, oh, Buddha, you are great, you are wonderful, you are mighty, uh, and uh, asking for favors to the bodhisattva of compassion or something, as you please help me, help me, I'm sick, I need healing, heal my sickness, or... Uh, you know, I need a BMW, uh, like they still do in Japan with the uh, uh, Ringekyo Buddhism, uh, you know, uh, I want a BMW, please, Buddha, send me this fortune here, I, I donate money to you, so make me rich. Uh, this sort of asking for favors, asking for help from gods and spirits, basic shamanism that I was talking about last time, asking the spirits for worldly help devotional Buddhism. And some of this is, uh, chant, you know, like chanting, 
sitting down and chanting, chanting scriptures of Buddhism in front of the statue, which can kind of be a kind of meditation if you do it right, you know, chanting over and over endlessly uh, something, and you can get in a meditation frame of mind. So it has something to do with Buddhist practice. But it's very much, it's a religious, religious kind of practice within it. Okay, number two. Number two kind of scholastic Buddhism, academic Buddhism, in other words. This way, they had the Buddhist scriptures from India, some of which are, you know, a thousand pages long, really big scriptures. And in scholastic Buddhism, monks would make their career. Once you become a monk, you learn to read classical Chinese or Sanskrit or Pali, ancient language of India, something, and you spend your career studying this sutra. You study, you read it, you read it again and again, you memorize the sutra, you learn all of its fine points, and you hear lectures about it from an expert teacher, you learn to debate its points with other students, you debate uh, what does this mean, etc., etc., and you become an expert, total expert on this one scripture, sometimes two or three sutra, but often the focus concentrate on just one. And you do this for like 20 years, 25 years, until finally you really get it. You totally, absolutely understand this sutra, and you take exams of various kinds, and finally your teacher, your teacher will say, you got it, you understand, you are enlightened for this scripture. And then he'll give you a certificate, a paper certificate, and that's you, you can start teaching the younger monks that same scripture. That's your, it's exactly like being in the university system today. Oh, go and study, 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 and get your master's degree, get your PhD degree. If I, your final you know, understanding of the sutra is like getting a PhD degree, and master says you're enlightened, that's the same thing, you graduate with a PhD, and then you are qualified to teach the next generation. It's academic Buddhism, scholastic Buddhism. And a lot of the Buddhism we talk about is that. Uh, through the centuries, great monasteries devoted to study with big libraries, lectures all the time. And no, they don't do anything economically productive, notice. And so this kind of Buddhism is, and the devotional Buddhism to some extent also, very dependent on the government. Because the government had all the gold in those days. <laughs> controlling everything, and government and wealthy aristocrats donating, uh, keeping those, you know, for the construction of the monastery, for the golden Buddha statue at the center, for all the monks to get food every day and get their silk robes and get to spend their time to study, 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 and to pay the teachers, and all this is just government supported. Uh, it's just like a public uh, university, uh, just like that supported by the government. If they lost the government support then, if the king turned against Buddhism or turned against your kind of Buddhism, one particular school, then they lose their funding and if some rich donor doesn't replace that funding, they just go out of business. Temples would just go empty, monks would leave, there's no budget, and they go join some other temple and some other, some other school. This happened all the time in Chinese history. Uh, emperors went back and forth between supporting a particular kind of Buddhism and then another kind of Buddhism, or supporting Taoism, even the Chinese religion that came up kind of a rival to Buddhism. We're going to talk about more about that in a minute. Uh, and so they would switch their, their support. And some temples would go bankrupt and other temples would flourish all during Chinese history. So it was like that. Then the third kind came up as a revolution about 500 AD, as I said. One of the ways that the Chinese made their own school of Buddhism. A guy from India came to China and taught what we call Zen. Zen Buddhism, and uh, Koreans call it Sun. It's the same word, they just pronounce it. Uh, it's Chinese Chan, uh, India it's Dhyana, and in Korea, Sun. We know it as Z-E-N, Zen. Uh, meditational Buddhism, that word just means meditation, the practice of meditation. Bodhidharma, great genius, great 
uh, great uh, figure of religious history came to China from South India and he said, no, you guys are doing it all wrong. All this devotional Buddhism, all this scholastic Buddhism, you're kind of missing the point entirely. Sit down and meditate and become a Buddha. In other words, get enlightened, wake up. Right now, in this lifetime, the devotional Buddhism and scholastic Buddhism had become something where you uh, you figure you can't even do it in this lifetime. It's too difficult. You can't reach real enlightenment, real Buddhahood. So you just study, 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 or you pray and worship and chant, and you hope that as you're a good person, you'll reincarnate. After you die, you'll be reincarnated as a Buddhist monk at a higher level and work again, and it might take you a hundred times of lifetimes to reach enlightenment finally and get to go to Buddhist heaven of some sort. Uh, this sort of belief. Bodhidharma said, no, right here, right now, in this lifetime, if you sit and meditate for five or ten years, twenty years at worst, uh, to, to practice, you can be enlightened. You become a Buddha, and that's the whole point of all of this. The, all these scriptures, all these 10,000 pages of books, you might as well throw them in the fire. You don't need to sit and read things, and you don't need to pray to any statue. It's a piece of metal. It's, it's, it's such a statue, a statue, a painting. These are symbols. It's just a symbol. Bodhidharma pointed out, a, a statue of Buddha is a symbol of enlightenment. It's not a holy thing itself. It's not divine, and it's not going to give you any favors or benefits by worshiping it. Um, it's a symbol of enlightenment, and the bodhisattvas themselves are symbols of wisdom and compassion, and benevolent practice, and things like this. Uh, they're symbols of that. They're not gods in the sky someplace. So Bodhidharma, a revolutionary, kind of, as you can tell here, bringing Buddhism back to the original. He was really much more closer to what Sakyamuni was teaching a thousand years before him. In a thousand years, Buddhism had become very corrupt, which is understandable and reasonably normal. Uh, same thing, Christianity, imagine medieval Christianity into the Renaissance, uh, by this point had nothing to do with what Jesus was teaching you. It was all about war and power and money and oppressing the peasants and popes living in luxury. Such like this, it had become totally corrupt in the same way. And we had the Protestant Reformation, finally, in Europe as a rebellion against that. Now, same thing, Bodhidharma was kind of our Protestant Reformation. Back to the basics, back to reality, back to what Buddha was teaching. So this is meditational Buddhism, and it's the third kind. So you got devotional, scholastic, meditation. Um, the devotional and scholastic is what came into Korea and the, the king supporting kind of cults regarding the king himself is a Buddha and uh, uh, therefore you must obey the king and even worship the king as if he's a Buddha and in exchange the king gives lots of gold to the Buddhists. Okay, that's the situation comes into Korea, as I said, uh, 300 by 400, it's rooted by 400, Bekje and Goguria, uh, their tribal leaders have become kings. They call themselves king in the Chinese styles, establish a royal family, bureaucracy. Okay, then 150 years later, Shilla kingdom. You know Shilla? Down in the southeast part of Korea, it's ringed by mountains, so it's separated from the others. It's what's today called the Gyeongsang provinces, North Gyeongsang province, South Gyeongsang, with Daegu City and Busan City, all that. That was Shilla Kingdom. And they're very isolated. They're the farthest one from China. They took Buddhism and Chinese culture 150 years later, 150 years after the other two. That's amazing. Think about it. That's like eight human generations in those days. They just refused. They just said, no, we have shamanism, we have our own native culture, and we will not change. Uh, they regard Buddhism as a foreign religion. They killed some of the missionaries who tried to bring Buddhism to their country, and others they just ignored or ordered out. 
They killed some people. No foreign religion. Koreans can be like this. <laughs> and uh, they were like that later. When Christianity showed up, they killed 10,000 people. Cut off their heads before they finally accepted the religion. Um, okay. Let's think. So, you get Buddhism going in Korea then. By 527, Shilla finally accepts Buddhism. 527. They, after 150 years, they finally accept this. Then, all three kingdoms, Buddhism is flourishing and they're competing against each other. 200 years, uh, no, 150 years later, uh, in the late 600s, they have a big, uh, the, the war between them, kind of a continuous war between these three kingdoms. They're fighting for hundreds of years and finally comes to a climax and Schiller is the winner and becomes Korea as we know it. Unified Schiller, most of this peninsula. That's it. And they're really, by this time, officially Buddhist and Buddhism is rising higher than shamanism as the belief system, really, as an official thing. That's by about uh, the late 600s, okay? So our story today is all about the, this early stuff and then what develops as particularly Korean characteristics and then one master from about the 640s era, 630s, 640s, establishes really the solid Buddhism in Shilla. We don't have so many stories from the Baekje Kingdom and Goguryeo Kingdom, not so many, uh, about their development because the winners write history. <laughs> That's what always happens. A lot of the information, a lot of the relics we have are from Shilla. It's most of what we know. Okay? So now, to talk about exactly what is Korean about this. Okay? First of all, why do we even... Oh. Yes. Why do we even ask this? Uh, what's the relevance of this question? Well, religious identity. What exactly is Korean Buddhism as a religion? National, ethnic, and cultural identity about Koreans. Okay, about uh, who are the Korean people anyway? They're, they're different than the Chinese. They're not. They're not Japanese. They're different from even the Manchurians. They developed. Who is Korea? And understanding Korean Buddhism in this way, along with the shamanism, along with later Korean Confucianism, we get to understand the Korean people, their identity, and in a more practical way, tourism and other practical applications. Into I, I worked as a professor of cultural tourism for 10 years, worked for the Korean government ministry of tourism five years before that, and so, so I'm, I'm into that game and such, and national promotion, PR, marketing, brand image, as we call it. We like to play up, actually, and exaggerate somewhat the Korean aspects of Korean Buddhism or other cultures. Uh, internationally, there's a bit of a prejudice. People tend to think, oh, the Korean culture is just like Chinese culture. They just imported Chinese culture, and it's a variation then, an import, and such, which is, you know, not, Thoroughly true. Uh, they imported lots of Chinese culture, but then they changed it to a Korean flavor. And there's distinct different things you can see. And for tourism and promotion purposes, we like to uh, point those out, and we even exaggerate them a bit. <laughs> for the, uh, showing people this is Korea, it's Korean culture, it's not like the other countries. Okay? So there'd be some value in promoting them. Some people think so, and some not. Uh, some people even object to this within the Buddhist world over at Dongguk University, our major Buddhist university. People there I talked to, and the major Buddhist order. Some people are into this idea of a universal Buddhism, a pure Buddhism, and that's what we try to be. And don't talk about Korean Buddhism, we're just Buddhists. I say that there's really no such thing. Um, it, it, this does not exist. There's Chinese Buddhism, there's Indian Buddhism, and Thai Buddhism, and Japanese. Uh, every kind of Buddhism has its national characteristics, just as with any other religion. Really, there's, you know, American Christianity is pretty different from French Christianity, and from uh, the Christianity being practiced in the central parts of Africa. 
uh, have different characteristics according to their nature, according to the ethnic cultures involved in the national history and all these things. So it's never, there, there is no universal Buddhism. There is just various kinds of national Buddhism. Now, none of these characteristics are unique or could be completely different from neighbors. The things I'm going to show to you, you'll find some examples in other countries, but these are things that the Koreans really emphasize and do the most. Not saying that the Koreans are the only ones who have this, absolutely, but to a great extent, it, it's distinctive here in Korea. There's mutual influence with China, Japan, and Mongolia. They traded a lot, they exchanged, and not, I'll tell you some stories later that where you know, Korean Buddhists influenced Chinese Buddhism somehow. The things that they wrote, things that they did that were then copied and sent to China, and the Chinese say, oh, this is good, uh, developed on that. And certainly Japan, Korean Buddhism all for a thousand years had a huge influence on Japan. Uh, the development of Japanese Buddhism and Mongolia. The Mongolian, the Mongols conquered Korea here for a hundred years. They were here and they imposed some Mongolian tantric kind of Buddhism, some parts of which still remain here, especially in the artworks and the implements and such used in rituals. Some of that is Mongolian origins. And on the other hand, the Mongols over the century were influenced by China and Korea very much in their kind of Buddhism. So it's mutual, but still something distinctive, some national characteristics can be pointed out. These ones, I ended up through research, through consideration. I was writing a book called The Encyclopedia of Korean Buddhism, which if you really get nerdy about this subject, <laughs> would be interesting to you. It's 650 pages of every possible kind of detail about Korean Buddhism in English. It took me two years to write that. It came out a little more than a year ago. Uh, you find it on major book portals. It's called An Encyclopedia of Korean Buddhism. And for that book, I had to carefully consider through all these entries and such and all this information of what is really distinctive. And I got these eight factors that I thought really made something that you could talk about. Okay. The first one, a nature-focused influence from shamanism and Taoism. Uh, Compared to other kinds of Buddhism, Korean Buddhism is very nature-oriented. The natural cycles, the seasons, and just the beauty and the glory of nature, and preferring to be in nature, just such a positive thing. Forests, mountains, waterfalls, gorges, all the great Buddhist temples of Korea, somewhat by historical accident, are in the great mountains. They're not in the cities. This is very different from other We'll get to that as the next point. Other countries. They love nature. There's natural motifs. Like paint. Instead of abstract designs or purely religious, ideological artworks and designs, just simply nature motifs. Beautiful flowers, uh, pine tree scenes, whatever, are painted on temples, mountain landscapes. It's considered part of the religion. This comes... Part of it is our shamanism, which is very nature-oriented, as uh, in my last lecture I mentioned all about the, you know, the, the, the natural spirits and getting in harmony with them, and Taoism. You understand? Taoism, Koreans say dogyo. dogyo. It's a very nature-oriented philosophy about the cosmos, the great Tao, the principles of change of everything in the universe, not really dealing much with gods and spirits, but with uh, just the, the, the great changes of nature itself and how to live in harmony with that, that we as humans kind of go along with the flow, as we say in the West, go with the changes, adapt yourself to the changes of day and night and spring, summer, fall, winter, and of aging as you grow older and all these things, how to naturally adapt and have a low stress, uh, a low stress life that is harmonious with other people and with the natural world and preserving nature. Taoism is very e ecology oriented. Don't harm nature or nature will harm us, <laughs> which we are discovering very much these days. 
as a modern scientific principle, but they're very much into that, Taoism. Now the thing is, um, in China, Taoism and Buddhism are different religions, always have been. And for a thousand years, they were competitive. The Taoists imitated the Buddhists as far as like building temples and having Taoist monks and dividing into schools and orders, just like the Buddhists did. They kind of imitated the, the example and then set themselves up as rivals. And they were competing for government money. And protection is literally, you know, Taoist monks would go to the emperor and say, sir, uh, the Buddhists are wrong and such. Our teaching is much better. And the Buddhists would argue their case and the emperor would make his choice and give gold. And this was survival for these schools or religions in doing so. Or, or to the queen or to princes and other royal family members or other top level aristocrats. It was complicated. But it was competitive. And so you, they were very different. They maintained their different. It's just like, like today in Africa, say so there's Christianity and they're in the south and there's Muslims in the north and all over. They're competing and very violently so, but also in, in arguments ideology, Christian ministers and Muslim imams are saying, you're wrong. People should join our religion. You guys are false. Uh, it's very competitive and very sharp and very distinct. They point out the differences. They emphasize the differences. It's that way in China. Buddhism and Taoism. They were distinctly separated. Now in Korea, the big difference is Taoism never became a religion here. It was never officially established in the Korean Peninsula. And therefore, Taoist philosophy, Taoist ideas came into Korea, the, the great classic books and the practices and ideas, but never became something separate and distinct uh, as an institution, never became competitive with Buddhism. Therefore, the Buddhists adopted a lot of their ideas and practices. They found them sympathetic. And Buddhists would read Taoist books and go, oh, there's some good ideas there. And they incorporated it into their practice. This is the only country that this happened in. Not Vietnam or Japan or any such. They're more like the Chinese style. Um, in Japan, uh, shamanism allied with Taoism to become a rival religion against Buddhism called Shinto. And such. So, uh, here, this is the only case where they fuse together, essentially. And Korea, then, has the most Taoist kind of Buddhism in the world. Uh, the, the Buddhism with the strongest component of Taoism mixed in, which I found delightful. Now, this is a big reason why Korean Buddhism attracted me from the very beginning. Back at, starting back in high school, I was fascinated with Chinese culture and uh, university. I studied Buddhism. I studied Taoism. I understood the differences and the rivalry and such. I liked them both, both Zen Buddhism especially and the Taoist traditions I really loved, collected their artworks and such, and studied, you know, went with it. And coming to Korea, discovering that, hey, we here we have Zen Buddhism, and Taoism is all blended into it. It's all mixed together. It's uh, perfect. <laughs> you don't have to choose. Therefore, one time, to tell you a story, I was uh, visit one of the great temples, which I'll show you photos of here in a moment. Busoksa with a group, and we're taking a break, and I was in the private study room of the great master, the leading monk, the abbot of Busoksa, who was considered a living Buddha, an enlightened uh, great master of Korea, one of the top ten in the nation currently, uh, whatever, a, a living Buddha. And we were just relaxing at a break time, and he was serving some green tea to me, and we were chatting with my broken Korean, um, chatting a bit. And I looked up at his bookshelf, which I was doing there, you know, it's, it's always nice to see what books somebody has, you know, you're wondering who they are, and so I was looking through all these Buddhist scriptures, Buddhist books, all the classics, and then I noticed the Tao Te Ching. You've heard of this Tao Te Ching, which is the, the great Taoist classic by Lao Tzu, the original Taoist philosophy book, 500 AD, uh, 500 BC, 
the same time as Buddha was living, uh, wrote that, the, the great classic of Taoist philosophy. I noticed that in two volumes uh, on his shelf. And just, I'm joking, I'm just making a joke, you know, with a little gentle joke. Pointed out, I said, why do you have this? And uh, he said, huh? And I said, a different religion. I mean, it's as if, like, you're in a Buddhist master's room and say he's got a Christian Bible uh, on the shelf. And, you know, maybe that's a good reason to have that, but, but, but you might, you know, make a joke. <laughs> you know, Ooh, what's this doing here? Uh, on a copy of the Quran or whatever. All right, uh, it's a different religion. And he, he shakes his head. He, he doesn't understand me. He says, no, 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 no. Same wisdom. Same enlightenment. He told me. Same wisdom, um, uh, just expressed differently, I suppose. Uh, that's the attitude. That's the attitude within this. In China, they would say, enemy religion. Those guys are the enemy. But hmm. here, blended together. So you get like painted on temple walls, stuff like this. See here, an adept and such, a great master in the mountains. They are dressed as Buddhists. But this is a very Taoist mountain, the immortal kind of scene. And there are all kinds of immortals painted at Buddhist temple. Immortal, uh, Shinsun in Korean, spirit immortal, Shinsun, are very Taoist figures. They're figures from Taoist artwork and Taoist belief. The supreme goal of, of Buddhism, of course, you become a Buddha, a living Buddha in this lifetime. You wake up. You get enlightened, as we say. The supreme goal for Taoists, they also have a kind of enlightenment. They talk about enlightenment. But the supreme goal is to become an immortal. If you can, basically, you never die. You become a spirit being who lives forever here in this world. Not exactly forever, but let's say a thousand years, and you kind of fade away into the universe. But a happy, enlightened being uh, that does not age further or death and such Taoist immortals and these are painted all over Korean Buddhist temples Taoist immortals and that's fun think, think like that the young uh, Dongja boy here riding a winged dragon up to heaven this is a very old 300 year old painting at Tongdosa temple um, wow that's a very Taoist um, had really nothing to do with Buddhist ideas. And these are uh, on the upper level, on the inside of a main hall of Buddhist temple. I photograph these various uh, Buddhist arhats, but essentially Taoist immortals in their artwork. Guys like this. Here, look at, look at the, the humor involved here. The child playing with his eyebrow. <laughs> his little, very long eyebrow. <laughs> kind of a little child playing with it. and Maybe he's asleep. <laughs> And such a guy like this with his his, bot, his bottle and cup and such drinking. Drinking wine is more of a Taoist thing. Buddhists are not supposed to do that. And his crooked dragon head staff. He's very Taoist motifs. This guy is a really he's drunk. <laughs> this is like a drunken Taoist immortal um, <laughs> motif here and such in a Buddhist temple. He's not Buddhist at all. And such like this. The great sage, a great Buddhist master, but he's with a tiger, which is very shamanistic, very Taoist. It's kind of like the mountain spirit, the Sanchin, that I talked about in my last lecture, as I in the temple and the, the deep mountain, the grand landscape of the beauty of nature. This is very Taoist themed thing. Taoist kind of immortals on the roof of a Buddhist shrine, the ceiling, I mean. And again, a kind of Taoist sage, much like a mountain spirit. Uh, a kind of Taoist sage really doesn't look Buddhist at all. He has hair. He hasn't shaved his hair. So this is not Buddhist at all. And then the boy is coming here bringing ginseng. Ginseng root, uh, health, hanyak, herbal medicine, which is a very Taoist art in China, very associated with Taoism. So the seven sages of the bamboo grove. Korean style. They're supposed to be in a grove deep in a valley, but the Korean style is you put them on a cliff way up high in the mountains. That's the place where Koreans think you get enlightened. And um, there is a very Taoist theme from artwork but pictured on a temple. Okay? And a, a lone monk, lone monk in kind of a cave situation place. Taoist. 
uh, monk reading sutras, but he's got a deer next to him, a holy Taoist animal, and the idea of sacred trees and such, and studying out in nature. It's very Taoist feeling. And again, uh, meditation, and kind of deep meditation, maybe going to sleep, again, the long eyebrows, and a tiger sleeping next to him. He's kind of his pet tiger, very much like the shamanistic mountain spirit kind of theme. And an immortal, again, uh, it doesn't look like he really shaved his head. He hasn't shaved his head like a Buddhist. He's, got the, he's just going bald. It's very kind of a Taoist immortal with the, uh, the horse tail whisk, which is used by the mountain spirit, and also Zen masters, also in this country, are riding to heaven on a white crane. Very Taoist. Again, uh, riding on a fish. These are the sort of thing that Taoist immortals do, and this has nothing to do with Buddhism in particular. Riding on a fish in the ocean with his spirit power. Okay, And especially in Buddhist temples, they have great veneration for him, the Doksung, the lonely saint. He is a disciple of Buddha who stays here on earth until the next Buddha comes. He's the living link between Sakyamuni Buddha, who was 2,500 years ago, and the future Buddha, the next Buddha who will come, Mirok Buddha, as we call him, Mirok Buddha, who uh, will come and give a better teaching and more salvation to humankind when he does come to earth. And this could be thousands of years even from now. But this guy has to sit on earth and wait for the next Buddha to come. That's why his eyebrows are so long. He's so old. He's already 2,500 years old. Koreans believe very much in him. He's very much incorporated part of Korean Buddhism. And the way he's shown here in the mountains with the waterfall and with healthy, he, healthy herbs and herbs symbolizing fertility, fecundity, having many children, which is not a Buddhist value. It's a Taoist value and a shamanic value. Uh, prosperity, health, fertility, all that in this. And this is a figure that Koreans use as a way of praying for worldly benefits, you know, for, for children, for prosperity, for passing the exam. They pray to this figure, and it's a very Taoist, shamanic sort of aspect of Buddhism. And here's another picture of the same guy. All these kind of paintings around temples are quite unique. They're never done exactly the same way. That's what keeps them interesting. My lecture last time was about Sanshin, the mountain spirit. If anybody was here for that, and that's what really fascinates me about mountain spirit paintings. Out of thousands of them, they're never the same. They're always individual. And I keep finding new styles, new characteristics. These Duxong paintings are almost as unique as the Sanshin paintings. And it's these uh, Taoist sort of uh, side aspects to it that make it really interesting. Again, the fertility, fecundity, the, the pine tree behind, the peaches of immortality. These are peaches if you eat the sundo, immortal peach. And we have a mountain here in Korea named after that, Sundo San, mountain in Kyungju. Uh, it, it's Taoist. It's a Taoist concept from Dao, Chinese Taoism. If you eat this peach, you will become an immortal spirit. Uh, attain, and then it's, it only grows in a special garden in the far northwest, which only spiritual people know how to get to. A very famous Korean painting was made about this uh, orchard uh, 600 years ago, and such. And these here appearing in this supposedly very Buddhist icon painting, these Taoist immortal peaches. Yes. Strictly mixing genres uh, very strongly. And so, again, the duck song with uh, books is only scriptures, and here, the peaches again, the peaches of immortality, healthy, healing herbs, a Taoist banner that it bring in there and to this Buddhist figure. This one is right here in Seoul. And in Wang Zan, this is again the uh, the duck song, and again humor, folk humor. One more, you know, his eyebrows looped over his staff here, and over here the bird, the bluebird. He's picking up, he's catching the eyebrow, thinking like he got a worm. <laughs> Maybe he's gonna try to eat it. He thinks it's a worm, but no, it's his eyebrow. It's humor. It's a joke in 
uh, in what is supposedly a holy religious painting. Korea, this is Korean folk shamanism, which does include a fair amount, quite a lot of humor within it, folk humor, folk jokes, um, and such. And putting that into a serious Buddhist icon, you will not find that in standard Buddhist paintings, ever. There's no jokes. Okay, here, uh, and Shinjun Tenwa, which is an assembly of spirits, shamanic and Taoist spirits all through here, who are protecting and defending Buddhism. That's their role, that's their job. And often, like right here, this figure here, is the mountain spirit, the very Taoist, very shamanic mountain spirit. He's a Buddhist army general kind of figure who's bringing together all these spirits to protect and defend Buddhism, protect the Dharma. And within that, the mountain spirits, right there, and here, enlarged, uh, with his basket of herbs and his white feather fan. Many of these Taoist shamanic spirits are here holding weapons. They're holding swords or axes or some such. Uh, the mountain spirit never has a weapon. Only a natural symbol, symbols of nature, health, healing, harmony with the biosphere sort of symbols. Sanshin shrines, mountain spirit shrines, are in every Korean Buddhist temple. This is not true in Japan, it is not true in China, nor Vietnam, nor whatever. Rarely ever is, is a mountain spirit included within a Buddhist temple. They're seen as different traditions. Here, uh, these are found in almost every Buddhist temple. Uh, might roughly estimate 80% of the temples in the nation because the, the Chante sect doesn't have any, the Chante sect, but they're less than 10% of Korean Buddhism. And some of the mainstream Buddhist temples don't have one because the monks don't like it. The master or whatever is against it ideologically. But uh, most do, at least 80%. These kind of said, often at the back of the temple, uphill, they're behind the main hall, they're raised up higher than the Buddha. They're the only spirit shrine generally is allowed to be higher than the Buddha spirit uh, above him because he's first. Uh, they, they know that the mountain spirit was here a long time before Buddha was ever born. They acknowledge that. The mountain spirit's always been here, as long as the mountain has. And it's his mountain. He's the landlord. He's the original. He, it's his mountain. The Buddhist temple is a visitor. And they acknowledge that openly. They ask for permission to live here to the mountain spirit. They pay rent by mountain spirit ceremonies, pay rent in order for being allowed here. Even at these temples, as a trend of these Sanchingak, the mountain spirit temples becoming Samsungak. That's a larger, bigger shrine, more modern. This has just been happening in the past 30 years. I've been covering the, the evolution, the development of this. This old, and you see how they're letting the plants grow on the roof and such as old and shabby mountain spirit shrine and then uphill they've built this new uh, Samsungak. It has three spirits, three folklore spirits within it. And these are big shrines. In some temples, these shrines rival the size of the main hall. They're nearly as big as the Buddha hall. And some of them get I'm told by monks that some of these shrines have higher cash income than the Buddha halls do. I mean, the amount of money donation they collect from the box is bigger at this place than it is at the Buddha hall because Koreans love these spirits. This is right here in Seoul. This is the one you just saw, the duck song with the bird and such. He's here. This is the uh, seven stars of the Big Dipper, the sun and the moon, and the North Star. In other words, the greatest powers of heaven. The, the, the major stars and the sun and the moon. Uh, the powers of heaven. And then mountain spirit over here, Sanjin, that I introduced two months ago. Uh, this here together actually makes a philosophical triad then, a philosophical trinity. At the very root of all Chinese thinking, of all Oriental philosophy, more than 3,000 years old is the concept of heaven, earth, humanity as a trinity. Okay? The uh, equal to each other in importance, 
as a sphere, heaven, earth, humanity. Uh, Koreans say chun ji in. They each one influences the other two and is influenced by the other two in an endless cycle of change. This is the fundamental thing. This is so very different from Occidental thinking, from the Western style philosophy and thinking that developed in the Middle East and went to Europe, the Abrahamic religions, where heaven is dominant. Heaven's the creator. Heaven is everything. We, humanity, we are like servants of heaven, and our job is to worship heaven, and the earth is kind of nothing. It has no status. It's just material that we should use. It has no religious status bearing. Here, this is totally different, what came out of China, the idea of heaven and earth and human beings as each one equal to the other, and each one influencing the other, no dominant, uh, everybody changing in a cycle. Yes? The, in the Samsung, Samsung God, uh, maybe I missed that, but who are the three spirits that they are worshipping there? These ones? Or? These, yes. Yeah. The mountain spirit, the Chilsung, or the seven stars, and the sun and moon, and over here the Doksung, the lonely saint. Now these three, you see, these, these are folklore spirits out of shamanism and Taoism. These are here, but they're in a Buddhist temple. And they exemplify what I'm just talking about, Chunji Yin, heaven, earth, and humanity. The, the sun and the moon and the seven stars are the greatest powers of heaven. The lights of heaven, the, the power of heaven over human fate and destiny. Earth, the greatest manifestation of earth is the mountains, especially in this part of the world, this Korean peninsula, which is 75% mountains all over it. Mountains are the supreme aspect of earth. And the disciple of Buddha, who has become completely fully enlightened and even achieving immortality, is the best kind of human being, the supreme human being. The same as the sun and the moon are the supreme lights of heaven, and the mountains are the supreme aspect of earth. Heaven, earth, and humanity at their best. The best aspects of the three of those right together in the shrine. So people, some people, some Buddhist monks and those scholars, they kind of put down the shrine a bit. They say this kind of shrine is, is folklore. It's just folklore. It's you know popular superstition. But I'm pointing out, this is the most fundamental concept of Oriental philosophy, together with yin and yang, yin yang idea. Uh, it, the most fundamental concept is represented right here in this shrine by these three being put together. It's not an accident or something that these three spirits are here in one shrine being worshipped together. That's heaven, earth, and humanity itself. This is that three-part Taeguk sign. You, you've seen this all over Korea, right? Uh, red, yellow, blue in a cycle. You know what I mean? Like they use it for subway changing stations, even when the subway the lines are crossing in a station where you should change. They put that symbol, red, yellow, blue, because it's a symbol of change, endless change. That red, yellow, blue, that's heaven, earth, and humanity. And it's the most fundamental concept around here. It's in the architecture, in the artworks, it's in all of Chinese Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism. That concept is basic. Fundamental, and it's right here in this shrine, and part of a Buddhist temple. And there's nothing like this in Chinese Buddhism. Or Chinese Buddhism has, they borrowed the name from Chinese Buddhism. Chinese Buddhism has a hall like this called a Samsungak, it, which means three saints, three saints shrine. And I photographed these in China. It has three Buddhas inside of it, three Buddha statues, and they represent Buddha of the past, Buddha of the present, Buddha of the future. Okay, uh, that's is that's standard Buddhism. Let's call it that's Chinese Buddhism, coming from Central Asia, whatever. The Koreans made this uniquely their own. They took the same name of the shrine, but put these three in there with this concept. The mountain spirit, what I talked about last time. There's no reason to go into detail again, but mountain spirit paintings in Korean Buddhist temples. 
this Taoist and shamanic aspect, which is really very strong. So many temples have it and really have great treasure artworks like this and that are very unique. Notice here again the humor. The tiger glaring in anger up at the bird. Can't catch it. You know, a tiger can catch a rabbit, but he can't catch a bird. He's going to fly away. His anger is resentment. This is humor. And this is in a royal shrine. This mountain spirit shrine was established by the king of Korea at Geryongsan Mountain 300 years ago. So it's a very serious, you know, royal Buddhist temple, mountain spirit sort of shrine, and they put this humor into that. It's really quite charming. Great classics. This, these are both from the uh, National Museum collection, classical items of Taoist, very Taoist. Look at this kind of motif. Very right, Taoist kind of artworks uh, from Buddhist temples. Again, the dragon head staff and the spotted tiger and such folk Taoist motifs. This is from one of the greatest, one of the top five Buddhist temples in the entire nation. Out of 8,000 temples, one of the top five most important. This is their mountain spirit painting and it's highly treasured. This is from the museum of another one of the top five temples of the nation. For I mean, their museum, a very Buddhist style mountain spirit. He's mountain spirit, but got a big fat open belly like the Buddha of the future. This seems to kind of show the mountain spirit as the Buddha of the future, arriving, riding on a tiger. That the Buddha coming in the, in the future is actually a mountain spirit. A very radical sort of idea. This painting is 250 years old. Don't really know the intention behind it, but Mountain Spirit here, he has Buddhist scriptures, Buddhist sutras hanging on his pole, and he's got a guardian with a sword in it. Ugh. Very wild. And newly created, yeah? The top five temples in Korea, could you maybe name them? According okay. According to the ranking? <laughs> yeah. I have, on my website, I have a listing of the top 21 which is a combination of tourism value and religious importance, let's say. But I would say the top five, and I've debated this with other scholars many times, it's just an opinion. Um, I would give that as, uh, and not in any particular order here, but just the five that are at the top, uh, Bobjusa Temple at Sognisan, Sognisan Bobjusa, Gayasan Heinza, Gayasan National Park, Heinza, uh, Tongdosa at Kajizan Provincial Park near Busan, Tongdosa, and uh, Hua Umsa at Jirisan here. Jirisan, Hua Umsa. George. And Hua Umsa. Hua Umsa. Yeah, yeah, you're just there for the temple or the tea tour down there at Jirisan. And Songguangsa. Songguangsa, the great temple at Jomiasan, which unified Korean Buddhism. Uh, those five, I would say, are the top five temples of the nation. Other people would debate. There's a, another one or two or three that you can. It's like trying to name the top five best electric guitarists or something. You know. Sure, Eric Clapton, but who else? Um, I, I like that. But anyway, that's my list. And so, look at my website for the top 21, which is really more comprehensive. The temples you really should visit. The greatest and grandest temples. This is all about the new mountain spare paintings and just saying how. This tradition continues to develop. Temples are not ignoring and neglecting these Taoist and shamanic aspects, such as the mountain spirit. They're investing ever more money into it, making new, elaborate, and sometimes more Buddhist motif paintings like this that are really magnificent. And these are bigger and more elaborate than anything that was ever painted in traditional times. This shows a great religious strength, including female mountain spirits now which we hardly ever had in traditional times, but now mountain queen ideas as Korean women's status grows. Gigantic, a four or five meter mountain spirit statue over in Incheon City. This costs a lot of money, <laughs> such as the biggest Sanshin statue in all of Korea, and it's in Incheon, which hardly has any mountains. Surprising, the, the mountain this is at is only about 200 meters high. It's kind of nothing. But is there it this, is. Is this a toy or is this a sadang? Hmm? Is this facility called a sadang or is this no. a toy, a temple? 
Chung. It's a temple. Buddhist temple, temple. Yeah. yeah. Oh. It's, a Buddhist, it's a Buddhist temple, and this is over on the side. This is a mountain spirit shrine with oh. 77, for some reason, 77 bronze statues of the mountain spirit, perhaps representing 77 great mountains of the nation, and then this giant statue behind it with this. Uh, these things are built just because, like, the, the abbot, the, the leading monk of the temple, maybe has a dream, uh, a dream of what he should do. And in his dream, 77 mountain spirits said, you should enshrine us. Why 77? Uh, who knows? <laughs> Ideological. Um, they have dreams, they have visions, and they follow that. Here's another one. This comes from a dream, again, from the abbot of the temple. He imagines the mountain spirit here at the temple. It's a male tiger, female ti tiger, and a bodhisattva is riding in to visit the mountain spirit, a, bodhi a Buddhist bodhisattva visiting the mountain spirit. They were making a, you know, making a meeting or conflation between Buddhism and shamanism spirit. Uh, the abbot of the temple had a dream like this, so he told the artist to paint this. And so here again, this is the dream. The abbot saw himself as a young monk, as a young monk, imagine himself riding the tiger and then visiting the mountain spirit at his realm had a dream about this, the mighty mountain spirit and the, the, the monk visiting him, and so he painted this. This is of the nation's, one of the nation's holiest mountains, Tebek San. And out here at Jirisan, close to Waum Sa, is uh, what I discovered by 2002, discovered the biggest mountain spirit shrine ever built in Korean history. Anywhere in Korea, and in all 2,000 years, I'm quite sure nothing bigger than this has ever been made as by a senior Buddhist monk, one of the great, one of the top 10 great enlightened monks of the nation. He built this in this fortress-like temple up there, uphill from Wangsa. This thing, the San Wang Daejun, Mountain King Great Hall. A unique name, <laughs> just never been used. And it's equal, same size as the main hall of the temple, the main Buddha hall, given equal status with it right side by side. There's their old mountain spirit shrine. And then he built this, and inside of it, the biggest mountain spirit painting in Korean history, eight meters across, like the whole front of this here. Eight meters across, six meters tall. This is the most spectacular, mind-blowing thing, the painting itself. Must have cost $100,000, and altogether at least half a million to build this shrine, half a million dollars. Uh, this is something kind of important to them. They, they think it's important. Obviously, somebody thinks it's important. This is not just some minor folklore, disappearing, fading away superstition aspect, as the government would tell you. This is, somebody put half a million dollars into this. And uh, made this magnificent, magnificent painting with Buddhist bodhisattva figures in it and such. Mm. A blank. Now we get to our second point. And the other points go faster. Now that we've been through of that to fully explain that uh, Taoist Buddhist aspect of Korean Buddhism, which underlies a lot of this, the fact that it's based in Mount, that's Wamsa, where you just were. That's Wamsa, just seen from, I, I climbed way up on the opposing hill to get through the pine trees and be able to shoot that a long time ago. Uh, the great Wamsa, based in the mountains. Every other Buddhist country, big major temples are in the cities. Sometimes the historic way in the capital city, right in the center of the city. They used to be right in the middle at the main intersection, the great Buddhist temple. And many of them still are. In some places like Kyoto, Japan, there's a few great temples out in the mountains around the city, overlooking the city, but mainly the, the main ones downtown in there. Korea, through its Neo-Confucianism, which we'll talk about in a future lecture, destroyed Buddhism, uh, demoted it, and kicked it out 600 years ago, around 1400 AD, virtually made Buddhism illegal, drove them out of the cities, tore down the temples in the cities, and uh, uh, melted down the Buddha statues, confiscated their assets, drove the monks out of the city. By 1400, it was illegal for a Buddhist monk to even come into Seoul or any other walled city in Korea. The, the guards would stop them at the gate. 
not even allowed to come in. That's why if you look around historic Seoul City, inside the walls, there are no historic Buddhist temples. There's no temple older than 115 years, because 115 years ago, the Japanese, no, 105 years ago, excuse me, 105, 1910, the Japanese legalized Buddhism again and let them back into the city. So Jogesa, like Jogesa downtown, was founded at that time, as soon as the Japanese could legalize Buddhism, the colonialists. So, mm. so because of this, Korean Buddhists were exiled to the mountains, and not just nearby mountains, or the, or the deep, remote mountains for their big temples to be protected against the government, because they were virtually illegal and regarded as sub-citizens. They were put on the same, Buddhist monks were on the same level as prostitutes and butchers and garbage collectors. At the very bottom of society, the kind of people that a decent man would not even speak to. Uh, untouchables, in other words. Uh, so they're to the deepest, greatest mountains, the great holy mountains, deep, the Bektu Dagon range, the uh, very deep remote places. The monks retreated there, and already they had temples there for meditation and study, quiet temples. They built those temples much bigger to, to live and form their own little economy. They had farmlands, they had uh, vegetable gardens to uh, grow vegetables for themselves, and they depended on rice donations from local villagers to survive. They had their own way of survival, no more money from the government, no more support. And they did this independently out here in the mountains, and they were very sad about it. You know, they wrote poetry, uh, letters and things. The monks were feeling exiled. You know, oh, it's very tragic. We have to live out in the deep mountains. It's horrible, terrible, uh, to, far from civilization. Today, it's such good luck, such good fortune. Today, they live in the best places in Korea, the places we call national parks, the places we all would love to live, and the Hyundai Construction Company would pay a fortune for this site to build apartment complex if they could grab it. And so it's these are wonderful places in valleys, gorges, deep in the beautiful mountains with waterfalls nearby, grand mountain peaks behind us, the best places in Korea. So uh, hundreds of years of bad luck turned into good luck for them. And Korean Buddhism is, is more associated with mountains, more based in mountains, than any other kind of Buddhism in the world. Of course, there's Tibet, which is 100% mountains, land, so a little difficult to compete with that. So and Nepal, uh, kind of same thing. So let's not uh, get an exact comparison, but still, like out of all those, uh, the 21 great temples of Korea, as I say, you know, 20 of them are mountain-based in mountain areas. It's only that Jogesa temple downtown, 100 years old, is on that list. Otherwise, they're all great mountain temples. So this is about Korea. This is the Busoksa, the floating rock temple in great mountain area in a national park and with, uh, you know, built according to the mountain landscape. You notice it's not straight. The whole entranceway kind of curves around, very characteristically Korean. This is very Taoist. Chinese build their temple in a straight line from the front gate to the first building, next building, gate, gate, gate. You can look right through the gates in a straight line, right to the back side of the temple if all the gates are open. It's uh, built straight and in an exact square or rectangle. The Japanese do this too. The temples are very regular. In Korea, they adapt the temple to the mountain landscape, whatever is there. According to the rocks, they preserve the great pine trees and rocks and boulders. They just let them be. They don't cut them away, and they just build the temple around that. So if the temple curves, like in this case, or is in a very irregular pattern, that's fine. That's why every temple architecture layout in Korea is unique. It's different from the others, uh, it has its own way because it's on a unique piece of land. It works. If you go to China, tour the great temples, in one province, they're the same, the same, the same, same layout, same structure. The buildings are placed in the same place. 
each different kind of building, etc. in Korea. Uniqueness. From that temple, the view. You should visit this temple. Do a hippie Korea trip. With you. Uh, sure. This is one of the greatest temples of the nation. This is in the 21, the top 21. Very, might make it to the top five. Who knows? Um, uh, the view from there, very legendary. And they got this pavilion here, which is a poetry view pavilion. Is it the whole, this wooden pavilion's been there for 500 years. Just They build it just for poets to sit on the pavilion and look at the view and write poetry about it, which many have done, including some of the most famous poets of Korean history and their, their poetry works hang on wooden signboards inside the pavilion. Now this sort of thing, being up here in a place like this in the mountains for spirituality, it's very Korean. And the Buddhist temple, in this case the, the great Sokaram cave, is right up near the peak of the mountains, right near the top. Now again, something unique about Korea. Now Chinese have great Buddhist mountains, grand Buddhist mountains. They have some, although the greatest temples were always in the city. But they had Buddhist mountains and with clusters of temples at them. And one big difference is the Chinese would build a temple shrine right on the peak, exactly on the peak of the mountain, put a temple shrine to that uh, particular Buddha or the Bodhisattva that that mountain is dedicated to. His main shrine would be right on the peak of the mountain. Koreans never do that. You will never find a Buddhist temple up on the peak. Um, closest I've ever seen is uh, there's one about a hundred meters from the peak, but uh, uh, they they don't do that. They would, Koreans consider that arrogant, and Koreans generally consider the Chinese to be arrogant, so this kind of fits, that to put your temple right on the peak of the mountain, it's like you're conquering the mountain. It's like when mountain climbers these days climb and put their flag on the peak and such, like a conquering thing. Koreans say, no, 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 you don't conquer the mountain, the mountain conquers you. Uh, the mountain spirit is is very strong and to be respected. Koreans consider this would be insulting to the mountain spirit to put the temple on the peak, so they never do. It's a, if you know, the highest, on my website you can find a list of the, the nine highest temples in Korea, the highest altitude, the nine temples that are above 1,000 meters, and none of them are at a peak. They're always below the peak and such. No arrogance, humility. Okay, a third point. Preservation of orthodox doctrines and practices. Now, this is a contradiction to the first point. The first point is how Korean Buddhism blends in so much shamanism and Taoism. At the same time, they're very conservative about Buddhist doctrine. Okay, it is shamanism, Taoism, these are aspects in the temple, that's different. But their actual practices and doctrines of belief, they keep very conservatively, let's say. They hold on to the old ways. They don't like reform. They don't like modernization. Koreans have a tendency, as I said before, first of all, they resist religions. When a new religion comes, they resist it. They say no, and they'll even kill the missionaries all through Korean history. They've been like this. They resist and they say, no way, we have our own religion, stop. But then when they finally accept the new religion, they accept that the new religion is better, they become very fundamentalist and orthodox about it. They take the original root style of that religion and hold on to it. The Chinese, again, much open-minded, Chinese would easily accept other religions. China always had a dozen religions going within China and they thought that was just fine. The uh, Chinese would never kill a missionary. Uh, what for? You got a new religion? Okay, set up. Let's see. Uh, uh, different beliefs? That's fine. Chinese are very different like that. And the Chinese were into reforms and modernization. Chinese Buddhism, Chinese Taoism, the major schools, every hundred years there would be kind of a new idea, a new philosophy, a new great master who would preach a different way and get people to follow him and they'd change the ceremonies, change the practices, and Koreans would say, ha, the Chinese are liberals, Chinese. You modernists, you don't follow the proper way. We found the original way. We keep 
Buddhism in the old style, which is very valuable. It makes Korea like a museum, a bit like a repository of the old ways. They're still here, the old practices, the old ceremonies. Um, for example, I once had for I once had a PhD doctor, government official, scholar from Singapore who was a real expert on Confucianism, total expert for the Singapore government because they love Confucianism. He came and visited Korea and I was guiding him uh, as a tour guide. I took him to the major Confucian ceremony at the, the Confucian University, the main royal national Confucian shrine and they see the big ceremony going um, and his his jaw dropped, and he said, oh my God, and I said, what, are they doing it wrong? He said, no, 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 but they're doing the original style. They're still, they're still doing the style from 1400, the original Neo-Confucian uh, ritual ceremony style. In China, they, you know, in 1500, they changed it, and in 1600, they changed it again. And they kept modernizing. And in developing this out, but the Koreans are still doing the 1400, the original thing that came, that they got from China. They're doing that way of ceremony. They said, this is amazing. I've, I've, I've only seen diagrams of such a ceremony before. I've never seen one performed live. I didn't know this. anyone on earth still did the ceremony this way. Just the Koreans. You can't find that in China or Singapore. Just the Koreans. So it's like that. Now with Buddhism too, the, the old Zen Buddhism, the Bodhidharma's original Zen Buddhism from way back, uh, the way it entered Korea, the way it developed in Korea for a thousand years ago, they're still doing it pretty much that way. They follow that, fun, uh, the orthodox doctrines, the way that the Japanese modernized it and changed things, made it Japanese style. And, the Chinese had various modernizations, though the Koreans don't. They keep the old, and the old Hua Om Buddhism, the Avatamsaka, the philosophy and such, they keep the fundamental, original way, and they teach their monks in the college the basics. So, they're very much like that. It's very characteristic. Also, patriotic defender of the nation. Korean Buddhism is distinctive in this more than that of other. Uh, it, from the very beginning, they had the kind of function as, again, Buddhism very much tied in with the government. So whenever the country went to war, the Buddhist monks holding rituals, for our praying to the Buddhas, kill the enemy, please. Make us successful, our victory. Now that's fairly common. But especially that these heroes, these three, during the Imjin Weran, 400 years ago, the great Imjin invasion war, 150,000 Japanese samurai showed up in Korea. Koreans were virtually defenseless, had very little military or military skills, except for Admiral Lee Sun Jin down on the south coast. They had very little defense, and the Japanese marauded through Korea, uh, looting, destroying, burning everything, and stealing whatever they could. Um, and the great fighters. The Buddhist monks were some of those who rose against the Japanese and effectively defended the nation. This was 200 years after Buddhism was suppressed and put down and kicked out of the cities, 200 years after that. So that you might think the Buddhist monks really had no reason to defend Korea, the government of Korea, uh, whatever to support. The government had oppressed them for 200 years so terribly. The government was really their enemy. And so foreign invaders came in, and the Japanese are actually Buddhists. The Japanese samurai followed Zen Buddhism and brought things with them. And so you might think, you know, Korean monks might say, welcome Japanese. But no, these three were top masters at that time, top Zen masters. They decided to defend the nation, defend Korea. And they sent, they got monks organized as militia, military. You know, and because, now this ties in, mountain based, because the monks, the young men monks, they're mountain men. 
They're living in the deep mountains and living a hard life, growing their own vegetables, gathering firewood, trekking around the mountains to get food, fighting the tigers that are trying to attack the temple, whatever. They're mountain men. So actually, they were good soldiers. But not much better than the city Koreans who were Confucian scholars getting fast, sitting around all the time reading Confucian philosophy and writing poetry in calligraphy, as a, these monks were good, good, capable fighters once they got some weapons. And they were very healthy, had been in the mountains, vegetarian food, all that healthy young men. And they were very effective against the Japanese. Therefore, after this war, this war took six years, after that the government had to realize that, hey, Korean Buddhist monks are our patriots, even though we oppressed them so much. They're really famous, and so many of our people just ran away in face of the enemy, but monks stood and fought and died and were effective. They defeated the Japanese at some key points in battles, uh, and so they became heroes. And the, the Confucian government had to recognize the Buddhists as heroes. And, but these monks, how did they find the Japanese? Was it more with weapons, or did they do some kind of physical Taekwondo Hapkido training? No, they got, uh -huh. they got weapons. They got weapons. They they were not trained in the martial arts as we would have, like Taekwondo. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're just healthy, strong young men. They got swords and spears and pikes, because Korea had such things, of course. They didn't have much military, but they got what they could. And later, when if any Japanese were defeated, they stole their swords, because the Japanese swords were the best in the world. They conducted guerrilla warfare, irregular warfare. Korean monks did not meet the Japanese in some open battle in a big farm field. That would be suicide. <laughs> Japanese were the best killers in the world in those days. The samurai were unbeatable. But the Koreans would harass them. The, the Japanese would be marching into a valley, into a deep mountain, to get to a temple because they wanted to burn the temple and steal all the artworks and ship them back to Japan. The Korean monks would be up there on the hillsides and with bow and arrow shoot and then ambush them, you know, jumping out from rocks with a sword or a spear and, and then run run back into the mountains. And the Korean monks, they know the mountains, they know the trails. The samurai, they don't. They get lost. And as the samurai try to chase the monks, they get ambushed. Again, irregular warfare. The, the same way the Vietnamese beat the Americans, the same way the Iraqis have just beaten the Americans. Uh, irregular, very low cost guerrilla warfare, hiding and then attacking and running. Uh, Etc. Yeah, it works. <laughs> you can defeat an invader that way. Koreans have done so many times in their history. They they beat the Chinese. They beat the strongest army the Chinese ever fielded. A, a million men. They defeated them in 612 A.D. with guerrilla warfare. Only 10 percent as many soldiers, but they destroyed them. That kind of thing. So. Hmm. Uh, they did this. Uh, this statue is right here in Seoul, the Dongguk University, overlooking the Great Avenue. Master San Young, Master Susan is respected by every Korean. A great enlightened Zen master. He was 80 years old when the Japanese attacked, and he came out of his remote mountain temple to lead the charge and actually led the first group of Buddhist soldier monks. He personally led them, riding on a horse attacking the, uh, the Japanese camp. And, uh, he was 80 years old. And uh, after that, uh, uh, just directly, he's, since he was the senior monk of all, he's the one who gave orders at Nationwide, monks, mobilize. Don't just sit there. Uh, fight. Fight for your country. Okay, And uh, Young Yu did the same thing on the West Coast. And such. These three are enshrined. They, the government built shrines for them around the country for these three. The one of them are all three together. Uh, the government built that, the royal government, and had ceremonies performed for them afterwards. Uh, Samyang became the ambassador to Japan after the war. He's the one who made the peace, signed a peace agreement with the Japanese, and brought home a bunch of prisoners who Japan had kidnapped and taken to Japan. 
he brought many of them home, including art, precious artworks the Japanese had stolen. He brought 90% of those are still in Japan today, but he brought home a, a shipload of precious artworks and prisoners, a very good diplomat after the war. So the government built a temple, even though the government was so anti-Buddhist, the government built a temple for him afterwards. Samyang, uh, Samyang. And that's uh, still there at Hagen's Temple, a temple just for him to retire at and grow old and die. Okay. Uh, these are other. These, this is a this is a shrine built by the government outside of a Buddhist temple for those three and a monument the government set up. This is the modern monument for Samyang as military leader that's right here in Seoul. Okay. Another aspect: seeking harmony between and unification of Buddhist schools uh, philosophically. Chinese again very comfortable with different beliefs different religions, a dozen different religions, that's fine, no problem, um, and different Buddhist schools. The Chinese developed these great Buddhist schools and it was perfectly appropriate for them to have different different scholastic schools arguing against each other and the, the Zen Buddhism and devotional Buddhism, these different kinds of Buddhism, that's fine with China. Korea, not fine. Always an attitude right from the beginning of, hey, there should be one Buddhism. There should be one thing. These things should be reconciled. Why, why should different kind of monks be arguing against each other and saying your way is false? The, the scholastic monks and the meditation monks. Why should we have this? Why shouldn't it be one united Buddhism? The great hero Wong Hyo, I'll talk about in a future lecture, describe him, uh, developing a philosophy that all different kinds of Buddhism really mean the same thing. It's the same enlightenment that they are going for and such, uh, trying to unify and harmonize. He was back in the 600s. Okay. And this, this idea of oneness of all Buddhism. This Buddha represents not one particular Buddha of one particular type of Buddhism, but all the Buddhas blended into one. The Buddha of all Buddhas. This is a uniquely Korean thing philosophically. And this led to the further point, they actually united Buddhism, which is the only country that ever did so. They actually have a unified national Buddhism. Now, not totally, but let's say 80% of Korean Buddhists, 80% follow one way of Buddhism. There's two major orders, two top orders, the Joge order downtown here and the Tego order nationwide that have most, uh, together they have like 90% of the temples you will ever see around. And they follow the same doctrine. They believe the same things about Buddhism. Their only difference is the Tego order allows monks and nuns to get married. You can get married, you can have children. And temple, then you can have a small temple as family property. Then, that you can pass on to your children. Your son can become the next monk at this temple. Uh, that's Japanese style Buddhism. The pure Korean style is monks do not get married, no marriage, no children, no sex, and the temples belong to all the monks, to the order altogether. That's the only difference they have. Uh, that thing about marriage, uh, which is technical point, really. In Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist practice, they're the same. So this is the only country that actually unified. These are two portraits of uh, Master Tego, the Zen master, and here Master Jinul, who really unified Korean Buddhism 800 years ago, 1200 AD. Master Jinul managed to put together meditation Buddhism and the scholastic Buddhism bring them together, harmonize them, make them work together in a system, and uh, some parts of devotional Buddhism included, enough for people who want to do that. Uh, unified it, made it work in a system that the monks could accept, and the schools stopped arguing with each other, the schools merged together, the king approved this. This is a Korean kind of urge. So philosophically, they wanted it for hundreds of years and worked towards this in philosophy development 
finally he accomplished it. And for 800 years, we basically had just one kind of Korean Buddhism. There are some different kinds of Buddhism here in Korea today, the Chunte sect and other, but they're very minor. They, they compose 10 or 15 percent of any uh, monks or temples you'll find around, maybe only 10 percent. They're hard to find, actually. <laughs> um, and such. There is really a unified Korean Buddhism. No other country has that. In Japan, there's five or six major kinds of Buddhism, quite separate. In Thailand, different orders of Theravada monks who disagree heavily in Burma and such like that. And uh, even in Tibet, the famous Tibet, uh, there's three major kinds of Tibetan Buddhism. And the Dalai Lama technically is only leader of one of them. Um, it, they are divided. Korea is the only country with a unity like this, which makes it fairly unique. Yeah, they can, they're the only country where one organization, the Joge Order, can put itself out and say, we are Korean Buddhism, we represent Korean Buddhism. So we have like the Buddha's birthday festival held here by the Joge Order, and they represent that. This is the headquarters of the Joge Temple, and on their signboard, uh, every signboard has the mountain name, the mountain name, the root mountain of this temple, what's called the root mountain, like a hometown mountain of this temple, and then the temple name. Usually it's just six characters. This one's very elaborate. This is right downtown. What it essentially means is the root hometown mountain of everybody. Everybody's hometown temple. It's a reference to the you know, the unit of all Korea. This is the headquarters temple of the Buddhism of all Koreans. Wherever your family is rooted at which mountain, whatever, it doesn't matter nationally. And popular devotion and fortune seeking rituals to bodhisattvas. Same thing, uh, okay, last part. A big aspect, this comes from shamanism, this attitude from the shamanism, a bit from the Taoism devotion, devotional Buddhism to bodhisattva figures. These are like kind of a junior Buddha, second level junior Buddha, which uh, embodies one aspect of enlightenment. Enlightenment is the whole thing of being a Buddha, but different parts of enlightenment, particularly wisdom, compassion, benevolent action, the main factors of enlightenment that work together towards uh, becoming enlightened. Understand this. Wisdom, the, the mental, intellectual uh, thinking part of study. Compassion, the feeling in the heart. Sympathy, empathy, understanding people. And benevolent action, actually doing something real in the world to make the world a better place. Charity work, helping poor people, helping children or old people, and uh, community development and such, economic development even, and practice, like meditation practice, whatever, making yourself a better person. Actually practice to improve things. Those three, and each one of those has a bodhisattva, and the representing, symbolizing that value. The bodhisattva of wisdom, the bodhisattva of compassion, the bodhisattva of benevolent action. And those, there's also a bodhisattva of salvation after death, of proper reincarnation and heaven and hell uh, transformations, a bodhisattva representing that. Those four bodhisattvas are really important in Korea, and there's great popular devotion to them more than in other countries as individuals. <clears throat> Understand how these three work together for enlightenment. If you have wisdom and you take action according to that wisdom in the world, but you don't have compassion in your heart, you're going to be too intellectual. You'll, you'll actually end up hurting people. You won't have a good effect. If you have compassion in your heart and you do something in the world, but you don't have any wisdom, <laughs> you're not very smart, you don't understand, then you're going to screw things up. You'll make things worse. <clears throat> if you have wisdom and compassion, both in a good balance, but you don't do anything, 
in the world, then it's useless. Point of, who cares that you have wisdom and compassion? Only those three working together. You need to have wisdom and have proper compassion and then put it into practice. Really do something in the world to make the world a better place. If you do those three things together, you're on the road to enlightenment. And you're helping bring enlightenment to the world. So that's what these bodhisattvas mean. This is right here in Seoul. This is Dosan's, one of the greatest bodhisattva statues, the bodhisattva of compassion, made by Master Dosan himself a thousand years ago. It's right here in Seoul and is a constant place of worship, of devotional Buddhism. This is filled with women, uh, usually every day, all year round. Uh, during major times like school examination time, uh, the, this will be so overcrowded, overpacked with a long line standing outside for people to get in. It's believed to be a statue with great magical powers to help people uh, to enlighten and get good fortune. That's right here in Seoul. Finally, our last point, stone pagodas. Stone pagodas are Characteristically Korean, these are the biggest ones ever made by the Shilla Kingdom. They're out on the coast, gigantic. A person only comes up to the foundation story of that. Uh, a human, if you can see a human, and see there's the fence. A person only stands about that tall. I see these are gigantic. These kind of monument, Chinese built pagodas as Buildings, they're buildings, they're sky, they're towers, round or octagonal towers standing up, kind of a, the original skyscrapers of East Asia. They'd be eight stories, six, the first ones were four stories tall, and then six stories, eight stories, ten stories, like that. And from the top of it, you get a magnificent view, in other words. And they were stories for, they were towers and containing libraries. Within them were the Buddhist scriptures, and they were places of study and translation. On the road, that was their purpose. There were buildings inside, and the Japanese built the kind of pagodas in their characteristic way, um, also as wooden buildings. The Koreans made simply stone towers using their stone granite to put holy Buddhist relics inside these towers and keep them as focuses of meditational practice and devotional activities walking around them. They didn't, they only built a few. They did build a few towers, a few towering buildings, very few, nothing of which survives from ancient times really, but uh, one from traditional times, only a five-story building. Um, they built a magnificent, a really tall nine-story tower uh, back in the Shilla times, but that was destroyed and never rebuilt. And so, uh, these stone pagodas are all over Korea, thousands of them and they're really representative of Korean Buddhism. They became very fancy in style. Those were what I just showed you, more of the original style from Shilla, and these, this is from the Gorya Dynasty about 1,000 years ago. This is a great national treasure at the Odesan National Park, Wojongsa Temple with bells hanging on the corners, and a very fancy finial on top, and nine stories tall. This is one of the great national treasures that's uh, known by everyone. And of course, our most famous tourist attraction at all outside of Seoul, the Bulguksa Temple, most famous for its twin pagodas in the original simple style and then this very fancy one, which is completely unique. Never, there's no other pagoda like this from India, China, anywhere, and was never made again in Korea. Just this one time, this large, monumental, very complex design. It's a very deep philosophical design. It embodies Buddhist philosophy in these two. I'll explain that in some future lecture. <laughs> but this is the pagoda that's on your Tenwan coin. If you've ever looked at this, you've got one in your pocket, the back of the Tenwan coin, the only Buddhist symbol on Korean money at all. The only Buddhist thing right on this tiny Tenwan coin is this pagoda. It's so famous and so valuable. Stone pagodas. You'll see these all over Korea. Doltop, stone pagoda, little imitation thing that pe common people build out of rocks everywhere in the national parks by the stream beds, any rocky place, any place that's considered sacred at all Koreans build these stone pagodas as a kind of ancient thing. 
So, these eight factors I list as distinctive characteristics, things that are really Korean. We will now take a break, come back. If you have any questions, we'll deal with that after the break this time, and we'll come back and I'll spend about 45 minutes. I'll tell you about Master Jia Jang, the first, great first early master who created Korea as a holy land of Buddhism. It's a very dramatic story, so, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Now, if we will, turning in these very early days of Korean Buddhism, Master Jajang, one of the most important monks of Korean history and right at the foundational beginning and establishing a real Koreanness, Korea as a holy land. Okay, this is him, this is his name, in Hangul and in Hanja. Jajang Yulsa is his title. It means Master of the Vinaya, which I will Vinaya, which I will explain in a moment. Uh, the rules for the monks, Master of that. He's the only person in Korean Buddhism who has ever given this title posthumously. He was so important. Other monks have other titles after death, which usually are shared among them, great master or founding master or Zen master or something, but he's the only one who's Yusa, uh, Vinaya master, and Jajang is his monk's name. We don't even know what his real personal name really was. And this means Jajang Yusa, benevolent concealment, Vinaya teacher, that's in English. And the early seventh century is our number one figure. Born in 590, Okay? Remember, Shilla Kingdom accepted Buddhism 527. So, 63 years later, uh, this boy is born. Buddhism is still just at the beginning levels in Shilla. They're very far from China. It's very difficult to get any information. Even after they had accepted Buddhism and the king, the tribal leader called himself a king. Chinese sounds that I'm a Buddhist king. But so they had not that much idea of what Buddhism was all about, uh, what they were really supposed to be doing. But he was brilliant. He's from the Kim family, the aristocratic, the Kimju Kim, one of our oldest great Yangban families here. And he was, uh, suppose his parents did Buddhist practices for, to get a son for his birth. By 12 years old, he was known as brilliant, a great studier, uh, studier and uh, kind of genius to understand things. He could read and write classical Chinese very well as a young child who was brilliant and accomplished. But then his parents died, and he was already turning to Buddhism. He, already, he, he liked Buddhism, but once his parents died, he realized the great tragedy of life, the, the suffering and unsatisfactory nature of life, so he renounced all worldly attachments, donated his family estates to become Buddhist temple land, and such as gave up the family estates, left home, retreated to the mountains, and meditated on a skeleton. This is a typical Korean, a, a typical Buddhist practice from the very ancient days, um, still practiced in t Tibet today, to dead bodies, rotting bodies, and just skeletons to meditate in front of them. Uh, to remind yourself that this body is just temporary and is not something you should be in love with, uh, that it's something that grows and flourishes and then dies and is corrupted and ends up as just bones with the birds picking the remains off of it. That's what the body is, so not to be attached to the body mentally. And a tiny hut lined with thorny brambles. He put thorns, thorny branches, all around on the inside of a tiny hut and would sit in meditation so that if he dozed off, if he started to go to sleep, he would fall and against the thorns and wake himself up. This is a very severe kind of practice to stay awake and keep meditating. It just shows his great diligence. Um, he was called several times by the king. The great king of that time, King Jinpyeong, who was making Shilla into a great and powerful kingdom, the king said, come here to my palace and serve me. You know, be a minister. I've heard that you're brilliant. You know, you're intellectual 
you really have great capabilities, so I, I want you to be a government minister. And this way he could get money and power and wealth. But he refused. He said, no, I want to practice Buddhism. And finally, the king said, uh, uh, called him and said, you know, I'll kill you <laughs> if you don't. You have to obey me. I'm the king. My order is come here and be a minister. And he wrote a letter saying, I would rather die keeping precepts. That means practicing Buddhism as a monk. Keeping precepts for one more day than to live a hundred years breaking the precepts like as a government minister, as an official. I'd rather, rather be a monk one more day and be your minister for a century. And at that point, the king gave up. The king said, okay, I guess you're a Buddhist monk. <laughs> what can we do? You are devoted to that. So he excused him and let him be a monk and such. And he, uh, supposedly he got his precepts. Precepts are you know, where you vow, you swear to follow some rules, like don't eat meat, don't get drunk, don't have illegitimate sex, uh, don't steal anything, don't tell a lie, those kind of basic precepts that, uh, that you swear in becoming a monk. Uh, a heavenly being came to him in a dream because there was no one to legitimately do so still in Shilla at that time. There was nobody around him anyway. There wasn't that much of an organized Buddhism with a valid master who could give those precepts to the monks. So he got it in a dream. He lamented the lack of Buddhist knowledge in his remote nation, you know, Shilla, so far from China. He attained royal permission to leave and go to China. In those days, this is a very long and very dangerous journey. Shilla, or today, like Busan City, very far from China. Quite difficult to go there. He went with ten disciples. Uh, to seek advanced Buddhist education in the grand, glorious Tang Dynasty. Okay? This is in 636. Tang Dynasty started in uh, 618, was founded. And quickly, was, so at this point, Tang Dynasty was only 18 years old, but it was quickly flourishing to become the greatest civilization humanity had ever seen on Earth which it was for about 200 years. This is the same time that the Roman Empire, of course, had collapsed into uh, the, the Dark Ages as the Germans overcame them and such. Okay, so he's going to grand, glorious Tang Dynasty for advanced Buddhist education, and this means the Chinese styles of Buddhism. The Chinese have been developing since 500 their own kinds of Buddhism. He made pilgrimage to Wu Taishan, this is a Chinese mountain devoted to a bodhisattva. Chinese have four great mountains still today, north, south, east, and west, parts of the gigantic Chinese area. North, south, east, and west, mount, particular mountains devoted to a particular bodhisattva, which I told you about. This is a long distance shot, Wu Tai Shan, it's a great snow-covered mountain. 3,000 meters tall and such. It's, today it's a huge national park of China and a great place to visit. I've been there twice and such. In the central, there's five grand mountain peaks at Wu Taishan. That's why it's called Wu Taishan, Five Platforms Mountains. Each of these peaks is considered a platform. A platform, you'll see this still today in Buddhist temples. It's like a wooden table Looks like a square table, like this, like a stage, about this tall, a little taller. It's where a master sits, cross-legged, in meditation, and gives his lecture. A platform is where the, the Buddhist master sits and lectures the monks. In other than a Buddha, Buddha's, Buddha statues on the altar, you'll see, are sitting on platforms. There's a wooden... Uh, a wooden kind of table thing supporting the Buddha statue. That's a platform, as it's called, day. So, Wu Tai Shan, five platforms mountains. Five giant mountains kind of in a circle. And each one of those thought to be a platform upon which a great Buddha or Bodhisattva is sitting and teaching. And the valley in between those mountains, the valley in the center, is filled with temples devoted to the Bodhisattva of wisdom. 
Today, there, historically, there was something like 220 temples in these mountains. Uh, today, there's something like 46 that have been reconstructed and are operating after the Chinese communists wiped out Buddhism previously and such. Uh, Wu Taishan, great national park. This is the Dobriya, meaning the practice site of Munsu Bosa. This Korean term, you might wish to learn, Munsu. Bosal means bodhisattva. Munsu is then Manjushri or wisdom, a bodhisattva of wisdom. I told you wisdom, compassion, benevolent action, and salvation. Those four great bodhisattvas of Mahayana Buddhism, each one has their own mountain in China. Okay? So this is the mountain devoted to the bodhisattva of wisdom. It is also the northernmost. Uh, there's north, south, east, west in China, and this is the north one. So therefore, it's closest one to Korea. Okay? He goes there. This is Wu Taishan temples today in the snow, and there's a great kind of Tibet, Tibetan Mongolian style Dagoba in the center devoted to the Bodhisattva of wisdom, a very holy place, and uh, so many pagodas and towers and many, many temples. Great place, northern, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's UNESCO. Now, he went there to have a vision to actually talk to the Bodhisattva of wisdom. It's believed that the Bodhisattva lives there, some kind of god, some kind of spirit there at the mountain. And if you go there and you pray very sincerely and you do pilgrimage, hikes, or walks, you can actually have an encounter and talk to the Bodhisattva at any of these four mountains. So he was seeking mystical vision of the Bodhisattva wisdom, and he met a dragon king of the Taiga Pond. It's a great pond that's at the bottom of the valley, center of the valley, and dragons live in water in the Chinese style. So he met them both, and he was given gifts and given advice to take back to Korea. He was advised to build a nine-story pagoda in his homeland of Shilla Kingdom, the ancient capital of Kyungju. He said, if you do that, Shilla will become the greatest of the kingdoms and be the winner, which 50 years after Jajang, it was the winner and conquered the other kingdoms. They did build that nine-story pagoda. Find similar mountains. Find mountains that are similar to Wu Taishan, similar to these mountains. Five great peaks in a circle. Find an a rounded peak, not sharp peaks like Soraksan, but more rounded peaks covered with forest and such find mountains that look like that back here in Korea. Okay? Given precious gifts, holy relics of Sakyamuni Buddha. Sakyamuni, the guy who was the Buddha, who actually lived in India 2,500 years ago, real human, when he died, he was cremated. They burned his body, which is what they do in India, in Hinduism. Then, after the burning, they search through the ashes to see if anything is left. Pieces of bone, perhaps, or uh, bits of bone, uh, calcium mineral that gets crystallized by the fire, making calcium crystals, making little jewels that are called sariya. It looks like a little tiny diamond or emerald, but... It isn't. It's just made out of calcium. It's not valuable, but it's considered a very precious, holy relic. Now, if still today, if a great Buddhist master dies here in Korea, they have a cremation ceremony. They burn the body, and then they check the ashes. If there are none of these sariya, none of these jewels can be found, then they figure, oh, he wasn't really enlightened. He wasn't really a great man. Oops. We were wrong, and such. If they find, they usually they find a few, at least a few, and those are enshrined in a pagoda then, and used for remembering his memory. The Buddha himself, uh, or let me add, the greatest Buddhist master of the 20th century, the living Buddha of Korea, in the late 20th century, Master Songchul, when he died, they found 108 of those jewels in his ashes. 108 is a holy Buddhist number. It's the number of vows of the Bodhisattva of compassion takes. Uh, it's one of the, the holy sacred numbers and they found exactly 
108 of those jewels, confirming that he was the greatest living Buddha of modern Korea. And they built a giant pagoda there at Hainza Temple, Yitgaya-san, to enshrine those relics. Now, when Sakyamuni Buddha, the original Buddha, when he died, they found 3,000 of those relics. 3,000 of these jewel relics in his ashes, because he's the greatest of all time, right? Emperor Ashok, they were all, then they built a big stupa, stupa pagoda thing and enshrined all 3,000 in there. Emperor Ashoka, 250 years later, had that pagoda broken open, took the 3,000 relics and used them for missionary purpose, sent them with the missionaries all over his empire and even to foreign countries. So these relics are now enshrined in Sri Lanka, Burma, Thailand, all the way to Indonesia, and then through Northeast Asia. Some of those relics came over the Silk Road, and they came to China. So China had some of the relics of Sakyamuni Buddha, these Sarira relics. Master Jaja got some of those, was given to, supposedly given to him by the Bodhisattva wisdom at Wu Shan. How he actually got them, you know, we don't know. But this is the story. A hundred. A hundred of his Zarya out of the 3,000. That seems like too many <laughs> to be real, to be authentic. Uh, doesn't seem quite right, but anyway, that's the story. He had a hundred of them. A fragment of his skull, a Buddha's skull, that was left over from the cremation. His monastic robe, or a piece of Buddha's actual clothing. His robe. Now this is a 1,100 years after Buddha was alive, so it's doubtful that a piece of cloth would still exist. But again, this is the story. And his wooden begging bowl, or perhaps a piece of it, a piece of wood that was the, the bowl of Buddha that he begged with and ate from. Okay, supposedly Master Jaihan got all these things from the uh, divine spirits there at Wu Taishan. Now, he actually then did go to the capital of China and received advanced Buddhist education, teachings. He studied these three schools of Buddhism. In, these two are scholastic philosophical schools. The one in the center, Vinaya, that, what that means is the rules of the monks, how the monk should live. Now, every religion has this. So there's rules of Catholic priests or... Islamic imams or Jewish rabbis or whatever, Christian ministers, they live by rules, you know, that you must follow in order to be a leader of the religion. Buddhist monks have many rules, and there's a long tradition, thousands of pages of such, of how to live, how to be like vegetarian, eat vegetarian food, when you can eat meat, when there's special exceptions, when you cannot, what kind of vegetables to eat, and questions like, is honey, honey comes from bees, is that an animal food, or can it be considered a vegetable food? Mm. Uh, questions like this, and what kind of clothing to wear, and how to shave your head, and how often to shave your head, and how to behave, and how to do ceremonies, and how to no, no having illegitimate sex, and etc., etc., how to do all these things, uh, the rules by which a monk lives, therefore how a temple community is constituted, how there's leaders, and management of a temple and how to build the buildings. These are all part of the Vinaya, the Buddhist community, in other words. Okay? He became a master of that, those teachings. Say a thousand pages of rules and directives and designs of how to be a Buddhist monk officially. This is what's very important. He was favored by the emperor of China, and when he left, the emperor recognized said, you're a great student of Buddhism, and gave him gifts, great gifts of script, holy scriptures and Buddha figures and such that he could bring back to Shilla Kingdom. He came back to Queen Sundok. These are two possible pictures of her. Pretty famous person here. Uh, she was ruling queen of Shilla. Korea only ever had three official queens that ruled only three in all of its history, 2,000 years. Um, one of them, the last one, was not really ruling. She was queen in name, but her male relatives around here 
around her were really running the government and everything was totally corrupt and the kingdom was collapsing. So she doesn't even count. There's really only two that count. Queen Sunduk and right after she appointed a woman to follow her and Queen Jinduk ruled for seven years after her. She ruled for 16 years. Uh, so these two are the only powerful real queens of Korean history until 1,300 years later, we get Park geun elected president of the Republic of Korea. She's the first legitimate female ruler of Korea in 1,300 years. That's how patriarchal Korea has been. Maybe only Saudi Arabia has a stronger record of male leaders. It's been pretty amazing here. So that's the significance of Miss Park becoming president. It's the first one in 1,300 years. It means something for Korean women. Anyway, she is highly remembered. She was a great queen, a powerful queen. She, she was unexpectedly, that as a girl, she got to be queen. But once she was, she never got married, never had a husband. She took power and developed it. She's very comparable to Elizabeth I of England. It was the first time that England ever had a female ruler, and she never got married. She took the throne herself and resisted all the men trying to manipulate her and actually became a great queen. And, you know, uh, Shakespeare was during her time. She's similar in that way. She strengthened the Shilla kingdom. She built the military. She fostered Buddhism. She helped make Shilla into a strong kingdom that after her, after she died, 20 years after she died, Shilla was able to conquer the other two kingdoms um, and make a unified Korea. Here she is with the crown, here she is just kind of sitting on the throne, with apparently a leopard skin, whatever. And uh, uh, there's a TV show about her, a uh, whole TV series, Sunduck. And when they were putting a woman on the Korean money, you know, the 50,000 won bill, which is the only time ever in all Korean history a woman has been put on the money, okay, uh, Shim Sa In Dang is on that 50,000 won bill. She was the number two contestant. And they did this selection process of, you know, 100 Korean women who could be on the money. Shim Sa In Dang was the winner from the third golden age, but she came in number two. And a lot of younger Korean women, they want her. Um, the older Korean women, Shim Sa In Dang is the perfect housewife of Korean history. And she was a powerful woman who ruled the country. Korea, younger Korean women then favor this image. Okay. Sundar gave power to Jajang. When he returned to China, her role, she said, okay, you are gonna be my main Buddhist monk. You are the man now. And gave him money, gave him royal power, assigned soldiers to him, uh, allowed him to have as many monks as he wanted to do what he needed to do. So she gets credit for that. And so she appointed him supreme Buddhist monk, essentially. They didn't have the titles that they now have today of national patriarch or, or, or king's advisor that they now have, or later had in Korean Buddhism, but he became the first one called a supreme monk in the Shilla kingdom. And he established a royal office of Korean Buddhism, and especially this Vinaya school. This Vinaya, I told you that uh, the rules of the monks, okay, the rules of the monks that the monks live by, he establishes strict regulations for regulating practicing Buddhism. Understand how important that is. Every country regulates religion, right? Every country has laws about religion. Like, if you claim to be a Christian church, there's laws of what is a church and what is not a church. Okay. In America, just like in South Korea, churches are tax-free. So if there was no law, I mean, everybody would say, hey, my house is a church. <laughs> sure it is, and I'm a minister. No taxes. Thank you. Uh, everybody would do that, and in historical times, everybody tried to do that. Um, same thing with Buddhist temples, same way. And so there's laws uh, in every country of 
if you call yourself a church or a mosque or a synagogue or a temple and you want to be tax free, you have to follow certain standards. There's laws that say you have to qualify to get that. And if you call yourself a minister or a rabbi or a monk, um, there's legal standards as to what that is. Uh, you have to, you know, graduate from a certain school, pass a test, be a member of an organization, or else the government says, no, you're not. Tax, please. Okay? So, uh, he established that in Korea, and that was really important. Because, you know, anybody could just say, oh, my house, oh, it's a temple. Uh, sure, I'm a monk. Even though they don't know anything about Buddhism, they could just say, I'm a Buddhist monk, hello. <laughs> Um, listen to me, uh, but whatever. But John Jack made rules, regulations. He established standards. He said, no, you're not a monk, and you're not a monk. And no, get to work. <laughs> now working, and only those who, he made it so you had to study. You really had to study Buddhism and learn about it, and he made exam system, which still in Korea today <laughs> is such a big deal. You had to pass an exam every two years, or else you're kicked out. You couldn't be a monk anymore. You had to not only pass the exam to become a monk, but every two years take another exam of higher level to show that you were still studying. And if you didn't pass that exam, you're kicked out as a monk. And temples had to be real temples, you know, really established, properly established temples and limited in number, etc. Regulation of religion in the early days. He organized Korean Buddhism, very essential. Therefore, he's known as Jajang Yilsa, and he's the only one ever with this title, Yilsa, uh, Vinaya Master, Precepts Teacher. He's the only one with that. Uh, he is the organizer of Korean Buddhism, the original one, and there's no other. Okay. Now, he created the Jokmil Bogum Temples. You're going to love this. These are places you can visit. The holiest temples of Korean Buddhism. Not the biggest ones. Only one of them is one of the biggest ones. Only one. The others are not, they're rather small, in fact, but they're very holy, very sacred sites. And not some of them are pretty remote, hard to get to. Jokmyul Bogum. It's not bad. This means, okay, Jokmyul means silent nirvana or sublime equanimity. Uh, translate this in different ways. These are Chinese characters, is how it goes. But silence of nirvana or sublime, you know, not explicit, equanimity, perfect peacefulness. And bogum means treasure palace. So a silent nirvana treasure palace. A shrine of higher status than a palace or a Buddhist hall. You know, the hall of a Buddha, a Buddha hall, that's the most important building in a Buddhist temple. This is higher than that. And even the king's palace, this has a higher rank even than the king's palace as an important building. Treasure palace. Okay? So the silent nirvana treasure palace. Jokmyul Bogu. This is a very important term in Korean Buddhism. And pretty exclusive to Korean Buddhism, not shared by other countries. Now, what this means is, Jokmyul Bogu is a shrine containing the Sarya relics of Sakyamuni Buddha. Remember, he got a hundred of these. He divided them into five or six, it's not clear, five or six packages, and installed those packages at five or six different places and built temples there. And those places are called Jokmyul Bogu temples today. Okay? An especially holy site of Korean Buddhism, object of pilgrimage. People travel a long distance just to get to this temple and do special prayer there and such. Object pilgrimage, the origin, uh, etc. You don't need to know that. All right. The Sarya are generally enshrined in a stone pagoda or a Buddha reliquary monument, uh, a stone monument of some kind, in three cases, and an earthen mound, just like a tomb. He built probably a stone structure under it, but then covered by dirt and then grass, like uh, like the tombs that Koreans are buried in. In two cases, we don't know why, but he did in three cases and two cases like that. The term Jokmyul Bogu includes a shrine building. Usually, these shrines where he put the relics of Buddha in a pagoda or a mound, and then in front of that built a building, which was used then to worship 
towards those relics to respect the Buddha himself. Yeah. Now these are then special holy sites. The five extant ones, there are five of these remaining in Korea today. Uh, at sacred and scenic mountains, really beautiful places, always. Two are down in the valleys at the foot of the mountain. One is middle altitude, uh, this is a, a halfway up the mountain, just at some climb, and two are very up high near the peaks. Again, not on the peaks, but close to peaks. Again, different, and we don't know why he did this this way, but he was guided. The vanished one was buried under the central pillar of the nine-story pagoda, remember? The dragon spirit told him to build a nine-story pagoda, and they built it. And that was the tallest building in East Asia. The highest building in all of East Asia. It was taller than anything the Chinese built for the next uh, maybe 300 years before the Chinese built anything taller than that. And then uh, by 500 years, it was destroyed by the Mongols, burned to the ground. But it was this giant wooden tower, the skyscraper of all East Asia. Now, why? Why could Korea do this? Remember, we don't have earthquakes. Korean Peninsula here is solid bed of granite. We don't have significant earthquakes. China and Japan do. Very big ones. In China, they have the deadliest earthquakes in human history. As far as killing, and Japan has these you know huge earthquakes, volcanoes, and tsunami problems. In Japan, you try to build a very tall tower, a very tall building, and get, it's going to fall down on top of you very quickly, and such. And in China, they were limited in architecture until more modern times, and such. In Korea, they could build this gigantic nine-story tower, and it stood there for 600 solid years without falling down, because we don't have earthquakes. Simply that. But that was under. He buried relics of Sakyamuni Buddha under the central pillar of that pagoda. That was one of his Jyotiba Pagoda sites, but that all has vanished after the Mongols burned that. Nobody knows whatever happened to those Sariya, whether the Mongols took them or they were just burned or what. There's the only one now, that is the only one, it's part of a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The others are not, not yet. This is that pagoda. A gigantic temple built in the style of a royal palace, and then this huge nine-story tower in the middle. This was the skyscraper of East Asia from 640 until the Mongols burned it in the middle 1200s. 600 years it lasted. Today, that's what it looks like. <laughs> it's just a few pieces, a few bits of stone in the fields and otherwise it was just a ruined site. Koreans are talking about rebuilding this, uh, reconstructing it. This would be horribly expensive, really expensive. It would cost many, many millions of dollars. They're not really sure they're going to do it. They might, but uh, out of those Jukmu Bogung temples that Jajang established, two are now in national parks, two are in provincial parks, Two are in local protected areas. That's got kind of diversified. All have different monument styles, various pagodas and mounds. Each one is different from the others. Each, they have all been kind of reconstructed during history. It's been 1,400 years. There have been repair work and reconstruction that helped to make them different from each other. But they're probably originally different. He didn't make them all the same. Okay, his first trip north to do this. He went north from the capital along the Bektu Dagon Great Range. You've heard of the Bektu Dagon? I happen to be the national ambassador of the Bektu Dagon. <laughs> the government appointed me honorary ambassador of Bektu Dagon. It's the mountain system of Korea. This whole peninsula has one great mountain range running through it and then branches of that mountain range and then sub-branches like a spider web of mountain, that's it. They're all the mountains of Korea are united as one big mountain system. It's called the Baekdu Dagon. So, this means it's the spine of Korea. The, the main line of Baekdu Dagon is the backbone of this peninsula running from the north all the way through the peninsula down south. And it is sacred altogether. This is the Baekdu Dagon. Oh, down here, here's the DMZ, runs right across about right there. 
the DMZ, comes down here along the east coast, it runs here, then at Holy Tebexan, one of the most sacred mountains of the nation right here, it turns west, southwest, comes over here, and then drops straight down, and it finishes and ends at Jirisan. Today, this is a hiking trail. You can go from Jirisan, people start and hike up to the DMZ, where you have to stop. 735 kilometers of mountain hiking trail, united. And I, me and two partners, we wrote the first thing in English ever about that. We wrote a guidebook of how to hike this. Find it on my website, um, how to do this trail and such. And many people these days do. And I put up a whole website devoted to these mountains called thebigtodagon.com. Uh, the very first thing in English ever on the internet about it. And that's why the government appointed me ambassador of these mountains. Awesome. And for doing that. <laughs> I try my best, promoting me. <laughs> Seven national parks, four provincial and county parks, this trail goes through, passes through. Seven national parks and four major parks and such, and has all these kind of aspects along it. Okay, he gave, as he traveled north through these great mountains, he named the mountains, renamed them as Buddhist names. He gave them names that have Buddhist philosophical meanings. Okay, so creating them as holy Buddhist mountains. Previously they had some kind of folklore shamanism names, which we don't even know anymore. But he gave, and these names they now have. These are very famous mountains in Korea. Okay, this is a map showing where he put the Jukmil Bogun temples. Okay, in Gyeongju, the capital, his first one, that nine-story pagoda, the ancient capital. And then coming up north here, two, three, then four in here inland, and then six. Three of these right on the Bek to Dagon line. He came very inland for this. This is the way the river valley between these mountains here is going down to Seoul City, the Great Han River. So you're kind of halfway down to the very strategic, very important Seoul area. He put the fourth one. And then finally, the fifth one, the greatest of all, he established down here. That's Tongdosan. And we'll get there. So we'll follow this step by step. The first place he went, Odesan, which is Wutaishan in Chinese. Remember that great mountain I just showed you dedicated to the Bodhisattva wisdom? It's the same name. The Five Platforms Mountains. Wu Tai Shan. In Korean that's O Dae San, just Korean pronunciation. Uh, it's just, he gave the same name here. Because the Bodhisattva wisdom told him, he said, you find mountains that are similar to these mountains, that look the same, I got the same feeling, the same mood there. If you find them, you will find I am also living there. I'm also resident at those mountains in Korea, just as I am here in China. And so he went here first to these, but he found these mountains in the big, and he walked in there and he said, yes, yes, this is similar. This is the same kind of thing. Five great peaks in a circle, a great valley in between. Huh? And he found his hand and he prayed and he worshiped there. And yes, the Bodhisattva wisdom appeared to him and said, yes, I am here. Good luck. You found it. <laughs> Congratulations. This is it. This is uh, the top, the uh, high summit peak over there, and the great aspects. It's, a, it's National Park now, uh, Odesan National Park in Korea. And he founded there this temple, one of the greatest temples of Korea, one of the top 21 listed on my website, the Moon Vitality Temple, Wuljongsa, founded this, dedicated to the Bodhisattva wisdom. I already showed you once before the pagoda that's standing here. The, nine-story pagoda that he built after him. Uh, uh, not, not he built, but a few hundred years later, the, uh, this temple built. He didn't build it personally. This is early Gorya Dynasty, this great national treasure pagoda, and the statue, this statue of the Bodhisattva sitting worshiping in front of this pagoda. They're, they're, they're a set together, it's part of it. Uh, match. And these are together a great national treasure of Korean art. 
here, uphill from that temple, up on the mountain, halfway up towards the peak, he built this shrine and behind it the mound containing the relics of Zakimuni Buddha, which is this. This is what it looks like. There's just a small monument with a pagoda carved on it and this grassy mound underneath this inside here is the relics of Sakyamuni Buddha. He planted it into the mountain. He actually dug down into the mountain, put the relics of Buddha and covered it all up with a mound. Essentially kind of putting Buddha into the mountain. You know, and making the mountain, and the whole mountain becomes a pagoda of Buddha. There, he's making the mountain as a holy Buddhist site of pilgrimage. This temple is rather interesting. It's empty inside. There is nothing. On the window to this place. Oh, yeah, we'll get there. We'll get there. We'll talk about that. Yeah, they're ah, all really? built that way nowadays. We'll get to that with Tondosa. Okay, below that, uh, Sangwanza was also founded by uh, disciples of Jajang later, after Jajang. And this is also one of the great temples of Korea and has a very historic statue of the Bodhisattva wisdom appearing as a child, showing the childlike innocence. This is a great national treasure statue in this temple. And uh, after Jajang died, two princes who followed him as disciples built this temple in the same area. Then Jajang went up north to what we call Sonaksan and he founded this. Now this is just incredible. This is 1,200 meters high up in the mountains. In those days, this would be like a, let's say a three-day hike from any civilization. Like from the coast, there'd be just small, some fishing village town that is today Sokchou City. It'd just be a little fishing village in those days. And this is like three days hike from there to get up here. And no trails, I mean, they had to find trails find a way up. The mountains are covered in bears and tigers, Siberian tigers are living up here. It would be really dangerous. Why did he even go up here? And how did he find such a remote place? But somehow he hiked up in the mountain, I'm sure with an entourage of soldiers to keep away the tigers and uh, monk, hundreds of monks following him. But he hiked up here and he found this place of these towering granite peaks and put a pagoda right there on the edge of the cliff. See the people here and such? That pagoda, put that there in this setting, 1,200 meters up. Why did he do this? And this, you know, putting it here, you would think, you know, who would come and visit this back in those days? When the mountains are full of tigers. It's, uh, Koreans did not climb mountains in those days. It wasn't a hobby. And who did he think would ever visit here? I don't know. But he named these mountains after the Himalayas, the holy Himalayas, of, and he put that pagoda in there, and that became Bongjonam. This temple now is there, Hermitage, one of the highest temples of Korea, maybe the third highest in the nation, and sits up there, Hermitage, and still Buddhist pilgrims climb up here all the time. That's the mountain spirit shack, etc., and come up here to see that pagoda and visit Jajang's shrine. This is the pagoda. People worshiping here and this. And look, the, the view, the scenery. It's incredible. It's one of the most amazing places you can go in Korea. Just surrounded by towering granite peaks around you and Great Valley and all this. It takes six hours to walk up there from the near the large temple, uh, the, the Bekdamsa in the interior part. And it takes a few hours just to get into Bengdamsa and you sleep overnight. And it takes six hours to walk up here. It's heavy duty stuff. It's only for the serious. But many people do as pilgrimage. Close up. So Jajang built this in 640 AD approximately. And it still just stands there in all the winter. Then the other one. Inland, the one inland along the Han River in Yongwul County, near what is today Chiaksan National Park, but not in the park, just uh, east of the park. The great Bobhungsa Temple, great temple, 643, is that again a mound. They built a mound and planted the relics inside there and put this shrine building in front. 
still today. This temple was kind of ruined over history and just in modern times has been reconstructed. This is the mound and a pagoda, a Budo monument in front of it. And the Sajasan mountains behind it. The, that means the lion mountain. Mountain of lions. Such faint again the same. So it's one of the Jokmil Bogum temples today. The third one. Then, the fifth one is at one of Korea's grandest Buddhist temples, is designated as a national treasure of Korea. The temple is a capital of Korean Buddhism and is proposed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's now under proposal to become one. It is the great, down here, Tongdosa. At Yongchuisan, which means Vulture Peak, a peak upon which they imagine the Buddha sat right on this peak to teach the Lotus Sutra. It's the name of a peak in the Himalaya mountains, very sacred to Buddhism and Hinduism. They gave that, uh, Jaja gave that name to this mountain and imagined that peak as the Buddha's teaching place and built this temple at the foot of the mountain. And Tongdosa today is still technically the largest Buddhist temple in Korea. As far as the giant compound itself, and then it has around it 18 hermitages, 18 small temples up in the mountains. That's the largest amount of any. Uh, at Palgongsan Unhesa Temple, there are 17 hermitages. At Gayasan Hainza, there's 16 hermitages, and there's like eight of them around Songguangsa, etc. But this has 18. It's the largest amount of hermitages around one temple, and some of those hermitages are quite large, holy, really dormitories of monks and teaching centers. So if you put all that together, the 18 hermitages plus this main temple, it's the biggest temple in Korea. Okay? And still kind of a headquarters kind of feeling to it. It's known as the Buddha Temple because the relics of Sakyamuni Buddha are here. In this monument, this bell-shaped stone monument he built on a large platform, inside here he put crystal remains of Buddha plus those, thi those other things he brought, supposedly the part of his skull, part of the begging bowl, and part of Buddha's clothing, a scrap of cloth. Those things together in that monument. And supposedly they are there. And such, this got a bell safe, the original stupa, the diamond precepts platform, as it's called, Gungang Ketan. This is then really, in a sense, the holiest place of Korean Buddhism. This, is, if you want to choose one, this monument is the center. It represents Sakyamuni Buddha himself. Another view of it, and the buildings to the side of it and such. It's a stone platform of two levels high and square, and then a stone fence around it with gates. Visit this. This is the amazing shrine building built by Jajan in front of that. Now, this has been repaired many times. This is not uh, 1,400 years old, but really this building is more than 300 years old now since it was last rebuilt, and the building itself is a national treasure. And what's unique about it, inside here, uh, there's a main altar facing towards that pagoda, and on the main altar, there's no Buddha statue. Jajang designed it, just an empty altar, just candles on the side, but empty altar, and then a window behind it. In those days, there was no glass for windows, so it was just an empty space cut in the wall and with a, a bamboo shelter over it, and you could raise that up for ceremonies, so that when you worship in this hall, you're looking towards that window, you're worshiping directly to that monument. There's no statue symbolizing Buddha. It's not necessary. The Buddha himself is right there, or at least remains of him. So this has been copied now at the other Jukmil Bogum shrines, and certain other shrines around Korea have copied this design of having no statue and just a window to the holy monument. There's like a dozen places in Korea that have this design now, but this is the original that Jajang set up way back then. So there you see the window. In today it has glass on it. It's a glass window there from the back of the building and looking directly at the monument. See? 
those things now. Okay, winter. Mm, charming. Winter time. Now, this is a unique system that Korea has. Three temples, three great temples. Sambo Satal. Okay, temples of the three treasures. Only Korea has this system. The three treasures are well known among all Buddhism, all, all Buddhism in the world. They recognize the three treasures, which are Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. Buddha means the Buddha himself, the person, the teacher that was really here on this earth. Um, him, the example of him. That's why they put Buddha statues. It's a human being who became enlightened, and so can you. So the Buddha, example. The Dharma is the teachings of the Buddha, what the Buddha taught, represented in all those scriptures, the Buddhist Bible, the, the sutras and the sastras, the teachings of Buddha, the Dharma. And the Sangha means the community of monks, the monastic community. They continue the teachings. They continue the teachings, generation after generation, older monks teaching younger monks, teaching the lay people, therefore spreading the Buddha Dharma. They are essential. So those three things together, the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, together are Buddhism. And they're the three treasures. Only Korea has this system of three temples representing the three treasures, exactly. The Buddha is represented by Tongdosa, which I just showed you, because it has the relics of Buddha himself there. Okay? The Dharma is represented by Gaya-san Heinsa, and the Sangha is represented by Jogesan Songwangsa. In future lectures, I'll explain why those are such holy places, uh, why those represent those things. But these three are known as the Sambo Satchal, and every Korean Buddhist knows that. And it's kind of an obligation for every Korean Buddhist to visit all three of those holy places to make kind of a complete set. Now, the reason why this has remained then as the monument of Sakyamuni Buddha, Jajang made the rule, he said, to be a Korean Buddhist monk, you must take your vows, take your promise, swear to be a monk in front of this monument. This is where you do that. You have your monastic education, you learn everything, you, you serve as an apprentice, you know, for some years as a junior, and finally when you're ready, when you graduate, you pass the exams, ready to be a monk, you dress in your most formal clothing, and you stand with your master, with your teacher, in front of this monument, and you swear, I will follow the monastic way in this way. You become officially a monk here. This is still true in Korean Buddhism today. Over history, a few other places were established where this could be done for very geographical and political reasons, and a few of those still exist, two of them that I know of, but this is still the main one. And today, every monk of the Joge order, and many of those even of the Tego order, when they are going to become a monk, you know, when you finish your education, you, you travel down here and you stand there in a ceremony and you do it. You come up in front of this monument. Because essentially you're standing in front of the Buddha himself and promising to follow his way. So, going back here and such, getting back to number six, the last one, Tedexan. One of the holiest mountains of Korea, extremely devoted to shamanism. One of the very holy shamanistic mountains with very powerful mountain spirits. At it. I showed you some of Tedexan at the previous lecture talking about shamanism. Yeah, yeah. The Tedexan Jongamsa. It's actually at a different mountain called Hambexan that's next to Tedexan, but it calls itself a Tedexan temple because Tedexan is very important. It's a beautiful place. This, Jajang built this, or maybe this was rebuilt later. Some scholars think this was rebuilt in the Gorya dynasty to be this form because it's a brick pagoda and they just didn't do that back in the Shilla times. But whatever, he established the Buddha relics up here on this cliff above the temple. This is the main temple building and way up there, this pagoda sitting up there with a beautiful view over there and built that. And this is the shrine with the window in the back that's just below there, the window. You kind of get, got to get right under it and look upwards and you see this pagoda. 
a beautiful one. That's the sixth one of the Jokmil Bogum. And there, at this temple, like in most such temples, they have a shrine, Jajang Gak, uh, dedicated to him as the founder. And monks go in there every day and bow to his memory. Up at Tebexan, this is the ancient shamanistic shrine on the peak of Tebexan. Uh, Jajang climbed up here to this place where there's a water source. There's a spring of water there, and Jajang founded this temple, Mang Yongza. Look at the location of that temple. It said all encompassing view temple. And indeed, from up here, you can see just about anything, uh, everything. This is a, a, the seventh highest peak in South Korea, and this is just about 200 meters below the peak at 1,500 meters. I call this, in my evaluation, this is the highest temple of Korea. Some people argue, but I say it is from my investigations. Up here, this is the shamanic peak, the shamanism peak on the top. Amazing things happen there. Ceremonies for Dangun on October 3rd. You can go up there and see that. Few people do. It's very remote. Hundreds of Koreans are up there. Usually when I've been up there, back in the old days when I went up there, I was the only foreigner to ever show up and the Koreans were pretty sore. What the hell are you doing here? Uh, very sore, but they were happy to have me. And you can see a lot about this on my website. These days, more people know about it because of my website, because I put it up like 10 years ago and more foreigners are attending this. It's pretty amazing. Stuff going on. This is the temple down below that shrine. This is the spring of water. It's called the, dra the Yongjong, the dragon well. And it gushes, it's way high up near the peak of the mountain, but it gushes out a lot of water. There's a stream of water like this thick, just gushing out of the mountain. Yeah, which was really amazing. How did it so high up? How does it get that pressure? But somehow it does way up there. And Jajan heard that a stone statue of the Bodhisattva wisdom had appeared at this well, which is a sacred place for shamanism. This well is considered an origin of the Nakdong River. This is where the Nakdong River starts, flows down here into the valley and joins with other streams and becomes the, the Nakdong is Korea's biggest river, South Korea. It's the biggest, it's the third biggest river in all the Korean peninsula and the number one biggest river in the uh, South Korea biggest single river, the Nakdong. It runs from here, Tebexan, all the way down to Busan City. And this is where it begins, at this well. So Jajan came up here, hearing that a statue had appeared. He visited the Munsumong Peak, which is the other peak. There's two main peaks of this. I showed you the peak with the Shaman Shrine. This is the other peak, which not so many people go to, but a very 15, 15 meters, a little shorter, but it is a very sacred holy place with these giant stone towers on it. Okay. Moon Subong, famous for shamanism. This is a Korean shaman praying at a shrine, a stone shrine up there. Uh, these giant towers that people get on, there's five giant towers like that around the peak. It's a very mystical, strange place. You can feel a very strange energy up there, a very highly charged energy. It's all these stones and these towers, and there's lots of shamans up there practicing all the time that you can see. It's a wild place to visit. And Buddhist monks come up there because Jajan proclaimed he found the mother of Munsubosa. Remember, that's the Bodhisattva of wisdom, a kind of Buddhist god spirit who represents wisdom. Bodhisattva of wisdom. He said he found the mother of Munsubosa here as the mountain spirit. Remember, female mountain spirits. He said he found a great female mountain spirit at this peak who is the mother of the Bodhisattva wisdom. Now, in Buddhism, in all Buddhist theory, there's no such thing as the mother of a Bodhisattva. Bodhisattvas don't have mothers. They're just spot gods that spontaneously appear. They don't have mothers. They don't have fathers. That's not part of Buddhist doctrine at all. But by doing this, notice it, Jajang is bringing together shamanism, Korean shamanism of the mountain spirits, the great female mountain spirit, bringing it together with Buddhism, legitimizing, making Buddhism as a Korean thing, saying, oh yes, there's a great bodhisattva wisdom at the Odesan mountain, and here the mountain spirit is the mother of the bodhisattva of wisdom, 
the spirit of the speak. He's Koreanizing it. Okay? He died at 658. He was 68 years old. Just 10 years before Schiller finally unified the nation. After he did all this, he really helped to strengthen Buddhism of Schiller and make it so to conquer the other kingdoms. And there's a whole thing. He had a dream of a spirit who told him to meet him at a pass. He went there and met again the Bodhisattva of Wisdom, who told him to meet again at Tedexan, that holy mountain. Meet me there. He climbed it and found a Garbanji snake, and I don't understand what that means. He waited at Jonamsa, the temple. Then a strange, shabby monk came by and bluntly asked to see him. Just said, hey, I want to see Master Jajan. I want to visit him. You know, Master Jajan is the greatest monk of the nation. And Koreans, you know, they're very polite and they depend very much on protocol, on politeness and such. So there's a, you know, a beggar, a shabby beggar. But I want to see Jajan. And such. And uh, he, they drove him away. They said, you're crazy. You're a madman. You're so rude. Get out of here. Go away. But he turned out that was Munzubozo, the Bodhisattva Wisdom. He was testing them. Testing to see, are you really humble? Are you really humble people that would accept even a shabby beggar to see the great master? But no, they drove him away. So Jajang chased. Uh, they could see the light of the Bodhisattva, the spirit going away, and Jajang chased that light at 68 years old, and then he died at the Southern Pass, dying of exhaustion, heart attack. He was cremated and enshrined in a cave out there at Holy Tebexan. Okay, now what he did then, he gave Buddhist names to the mountains and he planted the relics of Buddha into the mountains, making them holy. He was replicating something that China had done, you see. Now, this goes back. When Buddhism came to China, Chinese people had a problem. China was more advanced than India. Higher technology, higher civilization. They were hundreds of years ahead of India. During most of history, they remained so. And so they were more advanced. They knew that. And they had, uh, they had their own philosophy. They had Confucianism. They had Taoism. They had the ancient I Ching. By the time Buddhism got there, China already had like 1,500 years. They'd been developing their own philosophy and their own system. And as you know, still today, Chinese people, they're very proud of themselves. They're very proud of China, the world's greatest civilization. So Buddhism comes. They're fascinated by Buddhism. But hey, it's a foreign religion from an inferior country. Oops, how can we believe this? How can we accept this? We're Chinese, we're proud. Uh, foreign religion? Uh, uh, that's a problem, you understand, psychologically. So what they did, the Chinese established those four great mountains as the homes of the bodhisattvas there and said the bodhisattvas live here. Okay, India is the land of Buddha. But the bodhisattvas of wisdom, compassion, salvation, and benevolent action, they live here in China at these four great mountains. Therefore, China is a holy land of Buddhism. It's equal to India. And therefore, Chinese people can believe in Buddhism without feeling insulted or <laughs> inferior. They can accept this religion. That was a whole problem. It took hundreds of years to accomplish, but that's what Chinese did. Jajang essentially just copied that for Korea. He went to China, met the Bodhisattva Wisdom. He told him, you find mountain there in Korea that looks the same as this, you'll find I'm also living there. Jajang did so. That's Odesan. The Odesan National Park, the Wu Taishan of Korea. The Bodhisattva Wisdom is resident there. Uh, Korea is a holy land equal to China. Because of the same problem. Why should Koreans believe in Buddhism? It's a foreign religion. And you hear that all through Korean history, people have said so. That, you know, Buddha, he's a guy from India. Why should we believe in him? We are Koreans. We got our own thing. But Jia Jiang was making Korea a holy land, equal to China, equal to India, the Bodhisattva living here. Later, other Buddhist masters, I'll tell you these stories, found the Bodhisattva of compassion and other Bodhisattvas here in Korea also living. It's as if the Bodhisattvas have their main house, headquarters office in China, but they have like a vacation house branch office here in Korea. And it's good enough. 
to make Korea a holy land of Buddhism. And with the mountains giving Buddhist names and such, Korea is equal to these others. That's what he's doing. So to summary, simply everything I have told you, he accomplished all these things as master of Buddhism, organizing Korean Buddhism in an organization that still lasts today. Well, he's gone through many transformations, but he founded all this and became the master of the monastic community. And today, Korean Buddhists have, have their monastic community look to him as the founder of it in a unified Korean Buddhism. And then the six special holy sites of Korea, which you should visit, if you can, they're all really picturesque and wonderful tourism places of like religious pilgrimage. Um, these and then other. He uh, established other great temples, supposedly, uh, with a continuing tradition, no, not that he established, but continuing tradition of Jokmyo Bogung sites, this is. These temples also claim to have relics of Sakyamuni Buddha at them at some other point in history, later point in history. Some missionaries or somebody brought this, including the 10-story pagoda at Seoul's Jogesa Temple, right here downtown Seoul. We know the story of that exactly. Uh, uh, a monk from Sri Lanka brought relics of Buddha here in 1912 when the Japanese legalized Buddhism in 1910. He heard about that and he came by steamship and he brought relics of Sakyamuni Buddha and gave them to the newly legalized Korean Buddhists and they had just bought that piece of land right in the center of Seoul to build the first urban temple in 500 years in Seoul and they built a pagoda and put those relics in it still in downtown Seoul today. Okay? And these other temples, they all these are major temples that claim to have relics of Buddha, this tradition. He, uh, Jajang is credited with founding 34 different temples, at least they claim. They claim, they say, Jajang started us. Uh, temples love to claim that famous monks, famous masters founded our temple because it makes the temple more important. It's not, sometimes there's not much evidence Okay, Sonaksa, including this one, one of the great ones, Magoksa, one of the famous ones in Chuchungnanda. And this is mysteriously, I say, because this was part of the Baekje Kingdom at that time, during Jajang's lifetime. It was part of the Baekje Kingdom, who was an enemy of Shilla. They were at war. How could Jajang go over there and found a temple, start a temple there, when their countries are at war? It just seems a bit unlikely. But maybe he did. I don't know. Maybe as a monk. He could pass through the armies and do that. I, I don't know. But uh, they claim that he founded it. It's one of the great ones. Mm -hmm. And for further information and about the, the Baekdu Daegan travel hiking guidebook and the encyclopedia of Korean Buddhism, if you want to see them, and more information about all these temples, more photos, more details about everything I've told you, is right here. And thank you for coming, and thank you for your patience, and running a little late. Any questions to finish? Do you know how long does it take to walk this 700 kilometer? Wait. 735 kilometers. It depends if you're Korean or foreigner. <laughs> no. Korean, Korean national philosophy, as you know, is bali bali. Yeah. Do it quick, faster, faster. And so Koreans are very proud at how fast they can hike the Baekdu Daegan, which means you don't see anything, you don't enjoy anything, You're just going as fast as you can. And they'll do it in like six weeks, because you have to take a little rest. I mean, a guy, you know, and your, your ankle gets injured or whatever, but it takes about six weeks. And I don't know, I don't know who has ever set the speed record, but I'm sure Koreans have somewhere for doing this. Uh, but my guys, my guys took 11 weeks to do it. Now, see, I recruited two foreigners to hike that whole trail when it first uh, became available and open because I got too old and I just can't anymore. I can climb individual mountains, but I can't spend 11 weeks on mountain trails going peak after peak after peak. I am no longer that young and strong. So I got two guys who are young, much younger than me and are super mountain men from New Zealand. Got them, and they had to be foreigners. I could not, I had Korean volunteers. You can't use Koreans. 
Because Koreans will go through the mountains and there'll be like a Buddhist temple, a shaman shrine. They'll just look over there and say, eh, who cares? This is the temple. Keep walking. Dolly, dolly, faster. Let's go. The next peak. Koreans will do that. They are like that. I don't even hike with groups of Koreans very much because that frustrates me. I see a shaman drive and I say, hey, let's go, take a look. Let's check it out. No, 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 no. come on, keep walking, keep hiking. Get it faster, to the peak, and then down. Um, actually, they're like this. So I got two guys from New Zealand who think the way that I think, and when passing by any monument or temple or shrine, they stopped to check it out and they took photos and sent the photos to me continuously, thousands of photos, checked out everything along the way. So it took them 11 weeks to do from September right into mid-November of one giant expedition. And I financed, I gave them the money to do this and set up. And also, I work all the time. I have a job, for God's sake. I cannot take 11 weeks to hike this trail. And so they, they were unemployed. They could do so. So together, the three of us, we wrote the guidebook and establish the websites and this, and it's been very successful. Now all kinds of foreigners are doing it. Now we wrote the guidebook as, you know, section by section by section, of course, and you don't have to try to do all 700 kilometers of car. You can do just part of the trail anywhere. And that's what many Koreans do. Many Koreans have formed Sanakwe. They call it Sanakwe, which means Mountain Hiking Association. There are many. Samsung, I'm sure, has several. Every company, every university, every institution usually has a mountain hiking club because it's the national hobby. And often these days, they form Bektu Degan Sanakwe, uh, devoted to hiking this. They swear, they, they all have a ceremony, a meeting at the beginning. They all swear that within, say, three years, three years or four years or five years, that they will hike all the Bektu Degan, 735 kilometers, and then they use their weekends, Saturday, Sunday, or holiday periods, or vacation periods, in groups to go, they do one section, one piece each time, because there are many places you can go up a road and find a trail and start, and then hike over the mountains for one day or two days, and then there's another road, catch a bus, and get out. There are many places along the way that have great temples along the mountains that do temple stay. You know, a 24-hour temple stay experience. So you can actually go to a great temple and have a temple stay experience and then take off hiking right from that temple, go over the Baek Dugan Trail for look, two days or three days or four days, arriving at another great temple and do temple stay again. So it can really be that kind of religious pilgrimage. And there are many hermitages, Buddhist hermitages, up top near the ridge, high up, where you can all spend the night. If you're a traveler or a hiker, you stop by, they'll always invite you. You can sleep here in the building and they'll give you vegetarian dinner. So, so my guys discovered all this. We wrote the guidebook about it and told step by step how to do this, where you get water, where you can find food, where you can sleep. Uh, first time in English for any of that. So anyway, my guys did 11 weeks and that's proper actually appreciating, <laughs> actually seeing things along the way. It's the foreigner's point of view <clears throat> that Korea is actually interesting. Koreans don't think so, as you may have experienced. I don't think their own culture is very interesting. We find it fascinating. Questions? <laughs> so Master Jaja, remember him. <laughs> And the Jukmil Bogum temples. He was a big one. Oh. And late in future lectures, we will get to more developments, more interesting stuff of great masters and great developments of Korean Buddhism, and then Confucianism, neo neo Confucianism, what that was all about. Okay. Thank you. Fantastic.